Welcome to Just a Minute. Hello, my name is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute waltz fades away once more, it is my pleasure to introduce the four delightful and talented performers who this week are going to play Just a Minute. We welcome back Wendy Richard, Clement Freud, Paul Merton, and playing the game only for the second time, Tony Slattery. Would you please welcome all four of them? <clears throat> For this edition of Just a Minute, once again, we have returned to the ancient city of Bury St. Edmunds. And it's a great pleasure to be here doing this recording, and I ask our four players of the game to speak, if they can, on the subject that I give them, and they try and do that without hesitation, repetition, or deviation. And Ling sits beside me to keep the score. She blows a whistle when 60 seconds are up. And Wendy Richard, we'd like you to take the first subject, which is anyone in this show... Take it any way you wish and talk on it for 60 seconds, if you can, starting now. Out of anyone in this show, I think I like Anne Ling best. She's so nice and helpful, good at her job, charming, kind and understanding. I'm also quite fond of Clement Freud. Before, when I first started in this programme, I used to have to sit next to Derek Nimmo, but now I sit next to himself. Tony Slattery, challenge. Re repetition of sit next? Yes, yes you sat next right. to too many people, I'm yes. afraid. Uh, so, Tony, you have a correct challenge. There are 38 seconds left, and the subject is anyone in this show, and you begin now. One of the weirdest things about all the other contestants in this show is that they all have pseudonyms. Wendy is, in fact, Maria von Stuppberger, <laughs> who is an exotic dancer, and the things she does with ping-pong balls are quite extraordinary. <laughs> she can balance them on the end of her nose, blow them up in the air, and then fire such a look of venom and poison at them that they will explode. This is a very popular act in certain Berlin nightclubs. Clement Freud likes to be known as Mr. Windy Pops. <laughs> Wendy has challenged you, and not before time, I think. <laughs> Wendy, w what is your challenge? Hesitation. I was surfing the laugh. <laughs> <laughs> if someone can ride a laugh, I think I can surf it. All right, then, yeah. you mm. can go on. Let's see what you're going to say about Clement, but don't upset him, because he can get very nasty. <laughs> <laughs> he's only got three seconds to do all the rest of the team. I don't know how he's going to achieve that. Three seconds left, starting now. An MP, Clement Freud, is... Clement Freud challenge. Repetition of Clement Freud. Yes, you, you yes, did say right, Clement yes, Freud the yes. last time. Yes. <laughs> Clement, you have half a second to tell us something about anyone in this show, starting now. Yes. <laughs> Whoever is speaking when the whistle is blown gains an extra point, and, of course, it was Clement Freud who is in the lead. Could I just ask, Nicholas, what yes. my pseudonym is? Well, I want to know what mine is as well. I'm rather keen. Yours has too many syllables, Nicholas. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe the next subject will give him a chance to tell us what it is, knowing how his mind goes. In I think your mind went years ago. <laughs> Tony, we'd oh, like you to take the second round. The subject is doggerel. There are 60 seconds, as usual, starting now. Time. Hesitation. Yes, absolutely What's right. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, sorry, it, it's not really hesitation. It's just I looked at you, Nicholas, and I temporarily lost the will to live. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm sorry. Yeah, that's all right. Does he affect you like that as well? <laughs> I thought it was just me. I yeah. did. <laughs> There's three people in the front row putting nooses around their neck. <laughs> Wendy, you have a correct challenge of hesitation. 59 seconds on doggerel, starting now. I've got a lovely little doggerel. She's a Cairn Terrier, and she's called Shirley Brahms. Just last week, she was photographed for a magazine. Hopefully, they're going to ask her back to be on the front cover. I'm very proud of her. She's also very fond of little Henry, my pet cockatiel, that I often talk about on this programme. I'm hoping that Shirley will soon have a film career. Nobody's challenged me. You were going to let me go on, weren't you? Paul Robert Merton has helped you out, Paul, yes. Repetition of Shirley. Yes. yes, Shirley. 35 seconds are left for doggerel with you, Paul, starting now. Well, I don't really know what doggerel is. <laughs> <laughs> uh. 
Cameron Freud, you were the first to challenge. Hesitation. Hesitation, right. 32 seconds for you to tell us something about doggerel starting now. Doggerel is loosely styled verse. Like... Uh, oh, uh, Tony Snatter. What's a bit of a hesitancy? Loosely styled verse... Uh, no. I What's don't think so. Oh, no. oh, they're all ganging up on me now. <laughs> Honestly, I have half a second at the beginning of the show and everyone's down on me like a ton of bricks. <laughs> uh, 28 seconds. Mr. Windy Pops never hesitates. <laughs> <laughs> never. <laughs> he sometimes has to say pardon, but... Yes. Um, <laughs> sometimes clears the top deck of a bus fairly quickly. <laughs> Give him a box of matches and it's party time. <laughs> uh, you have a point, of course, for an incorrect challenge and you have 28 seconds on doggerel starting now. There was a young man from Japan whose poetry never would scan. When asked reasons why, he replied with a sigh, well, you see, it's like this. I was trying to get as many words into the last line <laughs> as I possibly can. That is an example of doggerel because it is totally unstructured. Unlike if you want any flotsam, I've got some. If you want any gypsum, I can get some. <laughs> Paul, you were challenged. Why? Repetition of want, I'm afraid. Paul, you've got a point and the subject in six seconds on dog rule starting now. Since I last spoke on the subject of dog rule, I have been immensely educated as to what it actually is. <laughs> Paul Merton was then speaking as the whistle went, gained an extra point. He's in the second place behind Clement Freud and then Wendy and then Tony and Paul Merton. It's your turn to begin. The subject, black holes, you have 60 seconds starting now. I remember as a child wandering around Bognor Regis when suddenly my attention was drawn by a black hole there in the ground. I stared into this black hole and I could see nothing because, of course, it was black. Then suddenly I heard the sound of a cockatiel. <laughs> <laughs> it went... And I thought... Tony Snatter challenge. Repetition of woo. Yes. <laughs> Black holes and 42 seconds starting now. The brilliant astrophysicist Stephen Hawking postulates the possibility of a black hole in which time can not only run backwards, but can stand still, rather like it does during the recording of this program. <laughs> black holes are an immensely complex astrophysical phenomenon. Inside of them, time can not only... Oh, uh, Clement Roy Challenge. Repetition of time. Yes, yes, thank you. yes. You were gone in your intellectual bent and... It yes, I must get that seen to <laughs> 21 seconds for you, Clement, on black holes, starting now. I spent some weeks in Calcutta looking for the original black hole, and it is extraordinarily difficult. I caught a taxi and said, kindly take me to the black hole, and the driver had no idea where to go, so we went to Bombay and tried another time. New Delhi was... Was that like, hasn't he? New Delhi was... I think there was a hesitation, Tony. You've cleverly got in with half a second to go. Black holes <coughs> starting now. Black holes. <laughs> So Tony Sattery was then speaking as the whistle went, gained that extra point, and uh, Clement Freud still in the lead. Right. Clement, your turn to begin. The subject is roads. Take it any way you like, and talk on the subject if you can, starting now. I'd like to take it any way, like um, Cecil. <laughs> it is extraordinary. <laughs> uh, not so much a hesitation, more of a black hole. <laughs> I just I'm trying to wonder strength. who Cecil is. I mean, uh, and why, takes why it? he wants to take it anyway? I know. Right. The subject <laughs> is roads, and uh, you have 55 seconds, uh, Paul, starting now. Well, I used to live when I was a small boy. As well as there being lots of black holes in the area, there were plenty of roads. My favourite road was the road that led all the way to the sweet shop, where Mr. Grinny Winnie would serve me <laughs> half a pound of sherbet lemons, a close relation of Mr. Windy Pops, would <laughs> give me blackjacks... Uh, Clement Fry Challenge. Repetition of Mr. Yeah, yeah. 36 seconds with you, Clement. You've got the subject back. You've got another point. You have roads starting now. There was quite an endearing Victorian <coughs> music hall song about the coachman taking the Lord Mayor from Paddington to Piccadilly without encountering a single road. He did this by going down Pall Mall streets, muses, gutters, 
and other thoroughfares which rhymed and therefore gave a certain rhythm to the chanteuse who performed these. I asked him... Paul Martin Jones. I'm sorry, I have, as I have said on previous programmes, I did metal work. Okay. <laughs> now, we are deviating from the English language here. What, what, what is this chanteuse? So what is this? Well, the well, chanteuse is a singer, but no. it's got absolutely nothing to do nothing with to do this. Nothing to do with Rhodes. Nothing to do with this chap. But Paul, I agree with you. Your challenge is correct. You have a point. Ten seconds. Rhodes starting now. There were five roads when I was a young boy. <laughs> Clement Freud challenge. He's already been, been a, a young, young boy. Been a young boy, yes. <laughs> you were down those roads too often. Clement, do you have the subject back? Another point. Six seconds. Rhodes starting now. When I was a young boy, there was only one Rhodes, and he discovered Rhodesia, which later became Zimbabwe. <laughs> <laughs> Clement Freud was then speaking as the whistle went and gained the extra point and he has increased his lead at the end of the round Wendy Richard will you take the next round the subject is forgeries will you tell us something about those in just a minute starting now one has to be very careful of forgeries, especially when it comes to banknotes. Have you seen the one at the value of £10, the latest piece of monetary paper? Paul, you challenge. Paul I Martin. knew it would be you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, it was severe hesitation, unfortunately. What's a severe hesitation? Well, that was quite nasty, wasn't it? There was, there was an element of violence in there. Oh, I see. <laughs> 49 seconds for forgeries with you, Paul, starting now. Tom Keating made a name for himself in the late 70s for being a master forger. Apparently, he painted several pictures uh, that were attributed to, I believe, Samuel Butler, and later it was the man I mentioned earlier who said, well, in fact, it was me that painted them. These forgeries were on sale in various art gallery shops and were, in fact, on display in various museums. And uh, Tony Satridge, up. Various, I suppose. Yeah. Repetition yes, there's a repetition of various, I'm afraid. Yeah. Tony, you've got in a point for a correct challenge. 26 seconds left. Forgeries starting now. Forgeries. The whole idea of authenticity is one that dogged for the whole of his life the brilliant French existentialist Angers Dreed. He obviously didn't like to pronounce his name like that, but he had a speech impediment, and that's why he could never pronounce the thing. Ah, uh, Paul Merton challenge. Repetition of um, pronounce. I think he, only I said think one he was just dying a death. Get mm. on. <laughs> He certainly hesitated, but no, I don't think he no, repeated no. anything, yes, mm, and uh, okay. you could have had him for deviation, because, I mean, that man didn't actually exist. Andre G did exist. Oh, oh that one, I didn't run out of your Not the person who makes your ties. No, no, no. Anyway, seven seconds are left with you, Paul, on forgeries, starting now. Oh, wait a minute, I thought you said, um... <laughs> Clement Freud has done. Deviation, it's Tony. <laughs> Paul, you uh, put me right. You challenged Tony, didn't you? I did, but you, you said that it was in the correct challenge. Absolutely right. I'm <laughs> and, glad you were and, listening. I'm glad and, you were listening. And from, I just, from that, I kind of rashly assumed that I hadn't got the subject. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, well, you did metal work, but I did carpentry. <laughs> the, uh, Is English your first language? <laughs> Tony Slattery, yes. Uh, it was an incorrect challenge from Paul Merton. So you keep the subject. And you have 14 seconds on forgeries starting now. One can always tell an inauthentic Rolex watch by the way the edges of the so-called wrist implement are roughened and have nowhere near... That's when not how you tell a, a fake Rolex watch. The minute hand doesn't move smoothly, it ticks. That's one of the other ways like I was that. going to go on to if, <laughs> if you'd just have let me expand on my subject. Well, I don't know how you tell it with a fake Rolex watch. Does the audience know about <laughs> fake Rolex watches? Well, they do now. I've just told them. If you believe with Tony Slattery that that's the way you tell a, a fake Rolex watch, then you, you boo for him. And if you agree with Wendy's description, you cheer for her. And if you know, I'm very grateful. So will you all do it together now? <laughs> Tony, you have the benefit of the doubt. You have seven seconds starting now. And... Uh, <laughs> Paul Merton, yes. That, that was hesitation. That was definitely yes, you're absolutely right. And you have forgeries and there are six seconds starting now. I used to make a living when I was about 16 years old by selling fish cakes to people that were not genuine. <laughs> yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So Paul Merton was speaking as a whistle. When got that extra point, he's now equal in the lead with Clement Freud. Then comes Tony Slattery and then Wendy Richard. And Tony, your turn to begin. Will you tell us something about William Bly of the Bounty and try and do it in 60 seconds, starting now? The Bounty is a long and, frankly, awful chocolate bar with lots of sugar in it. It's owned, and there's only one of them, by a man called William Bly. He's a greengrocer from Stepford. A lot of people mistake him for the famous, and some would say rather, aggressive sea captain who came to fame by whipping lots of other sailors. But that's obviously another story. <laughs> Bounties come in all shapes and sizes. I'm talking about the confectionery now. Some Clement Floyd challenge. The second confectionery. You had know. a bit of confectionery oh, before, oh, sorry, yes. 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 32 seconds for you to tell us something about William Bly of the Bounty, Clement, starting now. I think like Prince Edward, William Bly of the Bounty was a deeply misunderstood serviceman. <laughs> he was captain... <laughs> of a ship that went to the West Indies in order to introduce breadfruit as a simple means of... Um, <laughs> Tony Slattery, Chum. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I buzzed now. I wanted to find out what it was a simple means of. But, uh, <laughs> it was a simple means of contraception. <laughs> <laughs> Tony, you have a correct challenge for hesitation. 14 seconds. William Bly of the Bounty starting now. When you think about it, breadfruit was a rather dull thing to introduce to these natives. They could have had the internal combustion engine. They could have had... <laughs> Paul Merton challenge. Repetition of the phrase they could have had. Oh, you're absolutely right. I'd have given him for deviation too, because they could have had the internal combustion engine when William Bly of the Bounty was around. You're absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Five seconds of you, Paul. William Bly of the Mounty. <laughs> William Bly of the Mounty. <laughs> William Bly the Mounty? Yes, uh, he's the Canadian one. I'm sorry. <laughs> what a perverse universe you inhabit. I know, I know. He's on it's, tablets, you know. It's... <laughs> William Bly of the Bounty, five seconds, Paul, starting now. William Bly of the Bounty was a man who, of course, has been misjudged by history. <laughs> Paul Merton was then speaking as a whistle wind, gained an extra point and others in the round, and he has increased his lead at the end of the round. And, Paul, your turn to begin. The subject, Calais. Will you tell us something about Calais in just a minute, starting now? I don't really know a great deal about Calais. I did once spend a week there, um, having travelled from this great, wonderful country of ours across the Channel and found myself in this French port. I wandered around for a while and... A lot of people there seemed to be speaking in a language I didn't really understand because at school I did metal work. So I looked into the shops and the passers-by with their curious Gallic charm and after a while I began to fall into the atmosphere of the place. This is all a complete load of cods, while it was I've never been a Calais in my life. <laughs> Nevertheless, that doesn't stop me dreaming of those faraway lands that I have never visited and maybe now I never will. <laughs> Tony Slattery, your challenge. I think there was a bit of a stammer and a hesitation there. Yes, I think, I think so, too. Slate. Tony yes. Slattery, will you tell us something about Calais? And you have 23 seconds starting now. Very few people know that Calais is the world centre for the organisation of Nicholas Parson lookalike competitions. <laughs> In and around the port area, lots of people <coughs> run around the place. Jeff, Clement Floyd Chance. Repetition of people. Very few people know. Uh, yes, oh, yes, absolutely right. Yes, right. right. yes, yes you're right, Clement, yes. yes. And ten seconds, I want to hear more about the Nicholas Parsons lookalike competition. I thought I might enter it. <laughs> the, um, <laughs> Clement, you have ten seconds to tell us something about Calais starting now. Not to go to Calais, which Paul Merton has done, is what the French call Pas de Calais, which is their <laughs> version <laughs> of the Straits of Dover. <laughs> um, I've been... The Tony, it is your turn to begin. The subject is guilt, starting now. All the great moralists of history, as Aldous Huxley says in the preface to Brave New World, are convinced of one thing, that guilt is a bad element in personalities generally. A lot is spoken about Catholic guilt and the way people are brought up in Catholic convents. Clement Freud challenge. Two Catholics. There were two Catholics. Were there? Yes. <laughs> What are they doing here? <laughs> 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 These two Catholics walk into a pub. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Catholic yes. guilt. Clement, you have 41 seconds to tell us something about guilt starting now. If I had a guilt, I can think of nothing more delicious to make with it 
than sausages. I think I would take... Wendy Richard Chun. You had two thoughts there. If I had a thought, then he was thinking the second time. Hard. That's all right, you Wendy. You get on with your sausages. <laughs> 33 seconds starting now. The very best thing to do with this young female pig is to detach a leg, skin it... And Paul Merton... Deviation, that surely can't be the best thing you can do with it. <laughs> <laughs> you perhaps you could feed it and let it run out in the garden. <laughs> Start ripping its leg off. <laughs> All right, Paul, a good challenge. It's one thing you can do, but not the best thing you can do. 26 seconds for you on guilt, Paul, starting now. I was brought up as a Catholic, and I well remember going in to see the parish priest during confessionals, and you would have to confess your sins. Clement Freud. I don't you see a parish priest during confessionals. It's deviation. Oh, you thought terribly quickly, aren't you? No, you sometimes they pull the curtain back and give you a little wink. Oh, no. no. <laughs> Nonsense. And I'm sure the age He's he was talking about, he said to his mother, I'm going to go along to them confessionals. Now, I accept that that was the way he was speaking at the time. That's a bit patronising, isn't it, Nicholas? Well, no, know well, what you confess to the parish priest. So, 18 seconds, Paul, on guilt starting now. I remember once saying to him, I got this young female pig. And instead of letting her run in the garden, I pulled her leg off and I said, now run around the garden. And I did it twice, but never mind. Wendy. We had it, two runs round the garden. Yeah, we ran round the garden too much. Yes. Well, there was a limp round the second one. <laughs> Eight seconds for you, Wendy, on guilt starting now. I've got some lovely gilt picture frames at home, and in them I have likenesses of Shirley Brahms and Little Henry, my pet cockatiel. <laughs> so, Wendy Richard was speaking as a whistle when gained an extra point. Uh, Paul, it's your turn to begin. <laughs> Who am I patronising now? <laughs> No, honestly, you. <laughs> you're doing really well. <laughs> I'm still worried about being called an alternative chap. <laughs> <laughs> can we sue? Can I think the... we can sue, can't we? <laughs> Paul, it's your turn to begin. The subject is flannel. And there are 60 seconds, as usual, starting now. When I have a bath, one of the things that I always reach for is the face flannel. I love to have a good old rub around with this particular <laughs> thing. I get underneath the sink and I scrape all around there and then I sort of... Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, but it's buzz, so I'll carry on talking. Clement, your challenge. Uh, hesitation. Yes, there yes. is. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> So, the image you give us of you in the bathroom, I must... I suddenly had a very rude image in my mind, which I couldn't say. <laughs> I so know. that's what confused me. Clement, you have 44 seconds on flannel starting now. Oh. <laughs> there was a pause there, you could have built car parking. <laughs> yeah. Tony, you challenged first. I did. I think there was the merest hint of a soup song. The hesitation. Of Tony, you have 43 seconds to tell us something about flannel starting now. This story isn't going to be dirty, so don't turn the radio <laughs> off. Paul Merton Challenge. Deviation. Tony, when did you ever not tell a story that wasn't <laughs> dirty? Well, I was just about to. He was flannelling. He's right. <laughs> did a momentary spasm of pleasure cross your face, then? I don't know what you're doing out there, but you're on your own. Excuse me, it's the one paid member of the audience I got from my jet. Tony, you have 40 seconds to continue on flannel starting now. One of my strongest erotic boyhood memories was of a pair of short flannel trousers with which Sister Euthanasia at my convent used to whip me. It was a progressive convent. Ah! <laughs> Wendy challenged. I don't think this is the sort of thing we want to hear <laughs> on this programme. It's all he's deviating. Apart from that, I think he said convent more than yeah, once anyway. Yes. Wendy, you have 25 seconds to tell us something about flannel starting now. When I was little, we were sometimes given a flannel to grow mustard and cress on. This experiment that I never succeeded in at all. So I kept my flannel for washing myself. I sometimes use a flannel for little Shirley's face when she gets baby round there. But it's a very useful piece of equipment to have in the bathroom. Flannels come in various colours, in red and blue and... <laughs> So, 
So Wendy Richard has moved forward only one point behind Tony Slattery. Then Paul Merton is two ahead, and then it is Clement Freud just a little way in the lead, and we're into the last round. The subject is Francis Bacon. Clement Freud, it's your turn to begin. Will you tell us something about that gentleman starting now? Francis Bacon is the sort of generalization which I deplore, like Germany is sausage or Sweden is hero. <laughs> there was a man of that name who was a friend of my brother's. And many years ago, Francis Bacon came to my house for Sunday lunch. I think it was Christmas. And he spilt whiskey, which remained on the carpet for many years. There is a painter of that name who recently died. And if this is going out on repeat, he died quite a long time ago. <laughs> um, who... Paul Merton Chalice. Uh, repetition of died. Yes, he died, and he died quite a long time ago. So, Paul, you got in there with a good challenge. 24 seconds for Francis Bacon, starting now. Francis Bacon came round my house once, and I took his leg off, and I said, run around the garden. <laughs> and he hopped about, and he was in desperate pain. He said, this is no good at all. So we took him back to a surgeon. He said, can we sew this appendage back onto Mr Bacon? And so they did. They sewed throughout... Uh, the Wendy Richard challenge. Two sewed. Two sewed, yes. yes. Wendy, you've got him with seven seconds to go. The subject is still Francis. Francis Bacon starting now. I met Francis Bacon, the painter, a few times. I found him most charming and pleasant and good company. He had paintings hanging in... <laughs> very... Well, Wendy Richard was speaking as the whistle went and gained an extra point, and she has leapt forward, but not very far, I'm afraid. But the, uh, <laughs> Tony Slattery, who did so well on his first visit, didn't do quite so well in his second one because he finished in fourth place, just behind Wendy Richard. Then came Paul Merton, but only one point ahead. We are judged to be the winner, Clement Freud. <laughs> We do hope you've enjoyed listening to this edition of Just a Minute. And it only remains for me now to thank our four talented and entertaining panellists who have done so well, both in speaking on the subject and off the subject. And also to thank Anne Lynn for keeping the score and blowing her whistle so beautifully. And also Ian Messiter for thinking of the game and keeping us in work. And also for Sarah Smith, who tries to control us. She is, of course, our producer. From her, from them, and from me, Nicholas Parsons. Thank you for listening. Hope you've enjoyed it. Welcome to Just a Minute. <laughs> Hello. My name is uh, Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute waltz fades away, once more it is my pleasure to welcome the four panellists this week who are going to play Just a Minute. And we welcome back three of our regular players of the game, Wendy Richard, Clement Freud, and Derek Nimmo, and we welcome someone who has never played the game before, Alistair McGowan. Would you please welcome all four of them? As always, I will ask our four panellists to speak on the subject that I give them, and they will try and do that without hesitation, repetition, or deviating from the subject on the card. And we will begin the show this week with Clement Freud. Clement, a delightful subject to begin this particular show, farmers. Will you tell us something about <laughs> farmers in just a minute, starting now? I don't really know a great deal about farmers, other than that if they come from France, they pick up barricades and throw them at the police. They also tend to set fire to vans that bring British mutton over the 
Uh, Wendy Richard challenged. Hesitation. Yes, that was a hesitation, Wendy. So there are 43 seconds left, and you start now. My favourite farmers are those that are in the Archers. I listen every Sunday morning to the Omnibus edition. Phil Archer is one of the most... Uh, Clement Floyd challenged. Twice. Mm. Two yeah. Archers, yes. Farmers is back with you, Clement. There are 34 seconds left, and you start now. Some of my very best friends are farmers all around Cambridgeshire, Whittlesey, Wisbeach. March Chatteries, <laughs> Little Port Ely, and the villages of Meeple and Sutton abound with farmers, jolly, jovial people who go into the pub at lunchtime and drink pints of beer followed by small whiskies and large gins. <laughs> they drive Mercedes because life has been good to them. Sugar meat is wonderful, rapeseed brings them in much money in all sorts of currencies because at the moment... <laughs> going with great style until the whistle went and whoever is speaking that moment gains an extra point. Alistair McGowan, welcome to the show. Would you take the second round, which is the Beatles? Will you tell us something about them in just a minute, starting now? It seems hard to believe now that four small insects from Liverpool could have set the pop world alight as they did in the 1960s. I think it was thanks to their manager, of course, Brian Epstein, the man who turned them from these small, hard-backed creatures into the mop heads celebrated today across the world. One of their songs, however, has been grossly misunderstood over the years. That, of course, is the song Michelle My Bell, which does not refer to a girl or a girlfriend, but, in fact, to the hard, crustacean-like shape on the back of the insect's creature, thus giving the name to my shell. When did it we had your... two backs, didn't we? Yes, you had two backs. I'm sorry, Alistair. There are 29 seconds for you, Wendy. Beatles, starting now. I remember going to a Beatles concert at Hammersmith. You couldn't hear a word for girls screaming and shrieking. Some of them were carried out by St John's Ambulance. Thank heavens for them, because they obviously were in need of them. Uh, I... Clement Floyd, Charles. Three thems. There were three thems, I'm afraid, oh, Wendy, yes. Yeah. 14 seconds are left with you, Clement, starting now. I met the Beatles when they were playing in the ball ring in Madrid in 1966, and it was a wonderful night, an occasion which I shall remember until the end of my days. They were called Paul, Ringo, <laughs> John. Well, at the end of that round, Clement Floyd was again speaking as the whistle went, and Derek, it's your turn to begin. The subject, plugs. Will you tell us something about those in just a minute, starting now? Whenever I visit French farmers, I always find that they've stolen the plugs out of the wash basins. I always take reserves in my pocket because it's very embarrassing and indeed complicated, or may I say difficult, to have a bath when there's um, no plug. That's a challenge. <laughs> Hesitation on the word may? Right. Oh, no, he, yeah, he, slurring? He, he was slurring and swallowing, yeah. yes, we but agree. he didn't we actually agree. hesitate, mm. Mm. Alistair. <laughs> we agree with him. Clement and I both think that Derek did hesitate. He did manage Stop to keep... Stop putting your oar in. <laughs> Good <Both>. challenge. <laughs> He somehow vocally managed to keep going without actually hesitating, and I try to be fair to everybody. So, Derek, you have the benefit of the doubt. You have 47... Is this, new? Is this a new departure? What? <laughs> you trying to be fair. <laughs> Derek, you have the benefit of the doubt. 47 seconds on plugs starting the now. The European community has changed the electrical system of wires when you're putting in a plug. Beforehand, the live one used to be red, and you could sense the danger in it. Now it's turned brown, which is the colour of the earth, which farmers like. And I always <laughs> feel that this is not such a good idea, and the green and the yellow one is also a different shade than it was before, and we now have a blue. So when I put in a plug into the slot, and I have to do all the electrical work with it, I never think frightfully uh, safe. Wendy, you a chance? You said electric twice, didn't you? Yes, he did. Electrical. Didn't. electrical. Wendy, you have 17 seconds on plugs starting now. I'm actually very good about putting plugs on, but now I'm married, I don't see why I should have to do it myself. So I pretend to my husband that I really am quite useless at putting plugs on. And um, him Clement to do Floyd it. challenge. Putting plugs on twice. She's putting, she never said where she put them on, though, did she? Putting, <laughs> Clement, four seconds, plugs starting now. Just a minute is a very good programme. I would like to. <laughs> Thank you.
Well, Clemens Plug for just a minute, Captain. Going to the whistle went and gained him an extra point, and he's in the lead at the end of that round. And Alistair, it's your turn to begin. And the subject is cardigan. Will you tell us something about that in this game starting now? When a young man reaches the age of about 28, he is faced with a sartorial dilemma because at certain points in his life he'll be passing a shop and suddenly become interested in the sight of a cardigan. But should he buy it or should he not? Because he knows that when he does purchase such a garment and put it on, he will immediately gain 15 years in his age. <laughs> I face this dilemma several times, as you can tell by my outfit today. Um, the, oh, the, uh, 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 <laughs> I was getting carried away, really, I think, wasn't I? Bad luck, Alistair. Derek got in uh, 37 seconds, Derek. Cardigan starting now. It is really quite extraordinary, I think, that the seventh Earl of Cardigan should be remembered for a little woolly rather than the fact that he led the charge of the Light Brigade. Now, old Wellington and his boot, one can understand, but someone who had such a dismal disaster should have a cardigan Named after uh, Wendy Richard. Did hesitate. Yes, I agree. I agree, Wendy. Nineteen seconds for you to tell us something about Cardigan starting now. I play the character of Pauline, who is well known for her cardigans. I have actually grown very fond of these cardigans over the past seven and a half years. I believe that while I was away, supposedly in New Zealand, a character called Mrs. Hewitt gave my cardigan away. Derek Nimmo, Charles. Repetition of character. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Three seconds for you, Derek, on cardigans starting now. Cardigan Bay, I think, is one of the most lovely parts of the <laughs> So at the end of that round, uh, Derek, speaking as a whistle went, gained an extra point, but he's still only in second place behind Clement Freud and then uh, Wendy Richard and Alistair McGowan. Wendy, your turn to begin. The subject, nothing. Can you tell us something about nothing in <laughs> just a minute, starting now? I know nothing about anything, which is patently obvious for the audience when they see me and hear me trying to play this game. I could become quite an expert on nothing... I could lecture on nothing, I could rabbit on for ages without actually saying nothing. <laughs> or go uh, on. Clement, you challenge, yes. I'm sorry. Yes, yeah, no, you, no, you, you let two hesitations go and came in on the third one. The full stop. 40 seconds for you to tell us something about nothing starting now. It is desperately difficult to say anything about nothing because you are deviating from the subject, which should be entirely <laughs> empty and meaningless. So I might as well tell a poem to the audience, which is one that has little meaning, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Wendy Richard Chance. Yes, indeed, Wendy. I want to so it. you've got your favourite subject back of nothing, and there are 20 seconds left starting now. Nothing can be very important if you have a lot of things, because when one has nothing... Uh, Derek Nemo Repetition of because. You did say because before, I'm did sorry. I? Yes, oh indeed dear. you did, yes. Thirteen seconds for you, Derek, on nothing starting now. When the carpet layers away, <laughs> I would like to lie down and whisper sweet nothings into her glorious ear with that blonde <laughs> hair floating down on the wilderness. I told you before, Derek, when we play this game, you leave my husband out of it. <laughs> so, uh, Derek, speaking as a whistle went, but he's still in I second place. <laughs> Derek, it's your turn to begin. The subject is crook. Will you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? By hook or by crook, I'll be last in this book, as something one used to write in order of albums. There is a valid reason for so doing, because, in fact, a crook was one of the ways that the peasantry could go around towns and villages and actually go from the trees and take away the lower branches, that with a billhook as well, and they could actually keep those. And the Lord, the uh, not Clement Floyd Challenge. Two actuallys. There was two actuallys. Absolutely there. right. 38 seconds for you, um, crook, Clement, starting now. Too many crooks spoil the boss. <laughs> I've never heard boff before in my life. Was it not boff? It's Telling cooks. a joke. It's cooks who spoil the broth. <laughs> no, 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 no. We'd like to hear from you, Alistair. That's that was it. That was it. That was it. Clement, you have 34 seconds on crook starting now. The reason why they do this 
is with they come in and steal the saucepan as well as the cooker. It is an appalling thing. Uh, Derek Nimmo challenge. He is not now talking about crooks, he's talking about cooks. Crooks who steal from a kitchen. <laughs> to the inconvenience of cooks. We don't know enough. The audience are on your side, Clement, so I give you the benefit of the doubt on this occasion. 24 seconds, crook, starting now. The Pope carries one a lot. I'm not sure why, but... Uh, Derek Nimmo challenge. Because he represents the Good Shepherd. <laughs> it's not often that Clement has actually has his education increased on just a minute, but, but isn't that the reason... Course. Of course, well, that's all right. <laughs> there was no hesitation. There was no no, hesitation. that's all right. You get no another repetition. point, Clement. Right. It's all right. Mm -hmm. You were interrupted. Mm -hmm. And uh, Derek was showing off as usual. We don't mind. <laughs> that's what he, he comes just here said for. He didn't know why. I was just telling him. Right. Right. Clement, you have 19 seconds. Crook starting now. Although many people think it is to denote the fact that he is a good shepherd. <laughs> there are others who are less certain of this. The fact is that the papal uh, nuncio. Uh, Wendy Richard Chuck. We've had more than one fact, haven't we? No, we've only had Beg one. Beg your pardon, Clement. Yes. So Clement has another point I'm in eight seconds. Humble. On crook starting now. The prisons of this country are absolutely full of crooks who pretend that they are innocent, for which reason they are quite often. <laughs> So Clement got a number of points in that round, including one for speaking as the whistle went, and he's leapt forward, overtaken Derek Nimmo, and now he's in a strong lead. Clement, it's your turn to begin as well. The Sharks is the subject, and you begin now. Sharks uh, are... Wendy Richard Chan. No. <laughs> Talk about keenness, Wendy. He'd only half a second. Well, half, half a second. second could be a long time on radio, but <laughs> if you think it was not a hesitation, go on. Well... <laughs> Clement, you have 59 and a half seconds on sharks starting now. Like fish and chip shops, everybody likes sharks, but nobody much likes living next to them. Uh, Derek Nimmo, child. He liked it too much. He likes too much, yes. 53 seconds for you, Derek, on sharks starting now. Sharks are rather nasty creatures, in my opinion, actually, with a fusiform shape, and they're very voracious eaters with nasty teeth under their... Jaw. And I don't think... Alistair McGowan. Hesitation. Hesitation, Absolutely. Alistair. Correct. 44 seconds for you to tell us something about sharks starting now. I've always wondered why they never get a song in West Side Story, because the Jets have their own song, but the sharks don't get a song, do they? Uh, Wendy. Too many songs. Mm. No, no. Two songs, yes. Yes, yes. Wendy, 37 seconds on sharks starting now. I've seen several documentaries on sharks. I think they're fascinating creatures. They have the most amazing teeth because they grow in rows and as one falls out, it sort of moves forward like a conveyor belt. Mind you, I wouldn't like to go swimming in seas where there are sharks. Apparently, some time ago when I was in Hawaii, I was in the waters there, not realising that sharks were all over the place in the bay. You know when you see it on the telly and there's that, um, that Jack Lord. <laughs> so Wendy kept going to the whistle when she was actually driven by those sharks there. Alistair, it's your turn to begin. The subject is models. Can you tell us something about models in just a minute, starting now? As a boy, I remember friends of mine at school were fascinated by little pieces of wood and plastic which they would stick together with glue and other such appendages. And I'd always wonder how they could be so obsessed with these strange shapes. Football was my thing, you see. That was what I wanted to do. That was what I wanted <laughs> to talk Derek, about a lot no, and repeat yes. myself. Derek, you have got in there. I wanted. 42 yeah. seconds on models starting now. Jean Shrimpton comes to mind. I remember her at a Melbourne Cup when she actually had a skirt above the knee. And this caused tremendous outrage in Australia because the very first time they'd seen a mini skirt, afterwards they all wore them and they still do, and they call them pussy pelmets. It's very interesting too that Barbara Golan, for during my youth 
was probably the most leading and upstanding model in Great Britain. Nowadays, Jerry Hall, I suppose, is the person that we would look to. And certainly, Nick Jagger occasionally uh, had a glance. Uh, German uh, Freud, Jonathan. Yes, one of the didn't even get on. It was such delightful <laughs> rubbish. Um, there's ten seconds for you. Models starting now. Models is an anagram of seldom which is about right because I hardly ever encounter them these days. They wear clothes and walk along catwalks. So Clement Freud was in again speaking as the whistle went, gained that extra point and has increased his lead at the end of the round. Wendy, your turn to begin the subject credit. Will you tell us something about that in this game starting now? I always pay... <laughs> Derek Chuck. <Jones. sighs> very long hesitation. Listen, I've had this with you before, Derek. I have to draw breath before I can speak. Well, it's yes. called a hesitation when you do that. <laughs> well, actually... How come it's called hesitation when I do it, not when you do it, then? No, it was a very long... Often Derek begins before I say oh, now. fair enough. I didn't want no, to No, just Wendy. Anyway. Wendy. It's all right. I'm going to be perfectly fair and give you the benefit of the doubt, because I thought it was actually hesitation, but you have 58 I seconds... I don't want to talk about it now. <laughs> I've lost my train of thought, thanks to Derek. Well, you've so got he, a point for can... being interrupted. Well, all right, well, I'll have the point and he can get on with it. <laughs> if that's how you want to play it. You have the point. Derek gets on with it. Credit is with you, Derek. 58 seconds starting now. I'd like to give credit to where it is due, and that is the credit that I would give and present for this Clement Freud chant. Repetition of give. 53 seconds for you on credit, Clement, starting now. Credit is an anagram of direct. (laughs) Exactly what I shall talk about. Credit, where credit is due, is the sort of saying which I've always found totally meaningless. But... Uh, <laughs> Wendy challenge. Hesitation. Hesitation is correct, Wendy. You have another point, and you now have credit. you cred- see, that was a hesitation. That wasn't drawing in breath. <laughs> well, that's all right. You don't need to lecture me about no, it. I, I quite my agree. Point. Thirty-eight seconds left, starting now. I often do not get the credit that is due to me. I feel very bitter about this at times, but I must not let such things get me down. Credit can go against you at times, you know. You never know, really, what your credit rating is. And it is important to realise what one standing is with credit because you might be able to... Clement Freud is not giving me credit for knowing he's telling them not to buzz me. He wants me to go on for the full 60 seconds. Do you see what I mean about not getting credit when it's due to you? I think it's most ungentlemanly. I bet Nicholas has told Jane to leave that stopwatch alone. <laughs> I know. I'm not, I'm not the dumb blonde they think I am. Anyway, getting back to credit. I pay my credit cards off every month. I think it is most important not to let them get any interest of your hard-earned money. Let me whistle. <laughs> Remember that, Nicholas. I thought that was an unwarranted attack on the Chancellor of the Exchequer. Uh, (laughs) Wendy Richard not only kept going till the whistle went, so she gets a point for that. She gets another point for keeping going after, because I let the whistle go an extra 15 seconds. We've got a lot of points in that round with the help of the chairman, and... uh, (laughs) He's so modest, is our Nicholas, isn't he? And but you're ten points behind Clement Freud, who's still in the lead. And Clement, it's your turn to begin. The subject is anagrams. Will you tell us something about that subject in this game, starting now? I don't really know a lot about anagrams. <laughs> but if you do a crossword and find an anagram, the most sensible way to go about it is to put all the vowels in the top line and the consonants below. And that means that you can juggle with the letters on your piece of paper and quite frequently arrive at a correct answer. Anagram was the name of an exceedingly useful four-year-old hurdler who won the (laughs) champion trial stakes at Chepstow on New Year's Day in 1971. I remember the case because I backed the thing to win at 8-1. to Derek Nemo challenged. Win. Twice. No, he did one the first yeah. time, yes. Clement has another point. 24 seconds on anagrams, Clement, starting now. Anagram is an anagram of Margon. 
which is pretty important if you're into that sort of thing. I'm rather tired of speaking about anagrams because I seem to have done nothing else. Uh, Wendy Richards. I think he's hesitating. I think he almost was, Wendy. So you have ten seconds to tell us something about anagrams starting now. Every day I try to do the crossword in the telegraph. I'm not very good at anagrams, so I have to have help. It was be my ambition. Actually, I nearly finished it today. <laughs> <laughs> well, Clement Freud has increased his lead at the end of that round and Wendy Richard is catching him up. And Alistair McGowan, your turn to begin. The subject, great painters. Will you tell us something about those in just a minute, starting now? The person who just recently painted the front of my house was one of the best painters I've ever known in my life. He started up at the bottom and took off all the existing paintwork that was on the uh, aforementioned sill and then sanded it down, used a blowtorch. Uh, Jerry Nimmo, challenge. Hesitation, ah. Uh, only just. Oh, all right. Well, only and just. then he has covered it. And he's trailing <laughs> badly. I know, but I think what we might do on this occasion, as Alice has never played the game before, we'll give him the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> And 48 seconds for you to continue, Alistair, on Great Painters, starting now. His name was Roger, and he really was quite superb. I'd recommend him to anybody. He's in the Yellow Pages and lives somewhere near Wandsworth. Um, if you do, and, uh, however, have any doors... Uh, Wendy Richard, Hesitation. Child. Yeah, there was another hesitation. No benefit of the doubt that Wendy, time, no. Wendy, you must tell us something now about Great Painters, with 39 seconds left, starting now. We had a great painter to do our house when we moved in. Our sitting room was a lovely, bright, sunshiny yellow, and up the stairs and the halls are a lovely sort of pink. Uh, and Derek I said Nimmo, Charles. Repetition of too lovely. The too yes. lovely, yes, it was all too lovely, your home, I'm afraid, Wendy. 28 <laughs> seconds for you on uh, Great Painters, Derek, starting now. The Swagger exhibition at the Tate, I think, gives you a wonderful idea of some of the great painters, not only this century, in fact, but going back to Van Dyck and so on. And I do recommend anyone who has a few moments to spare to pop along to that gallery and witness some of the great painters of the last four centuries. Not only is Hoban... Uh, Wendy Richards... We've had centuries twice, haven't we? Yes, you had a century before. Well, listen, six seconds for you on great painters. One was centuries, one was century. What's the hundred years between friends, then? <laughs> Six seconds for you, Wendy, on great painters starting now. I'll have to call back our great painters, do the outside of the place where we live. I want this... <laughs> Wendy, it's your turn to begin, and I hope the men get this subject after you. It's called Having My Hair Done. <laughs> 60 seconds to go, starting now. Actually, I don't like having my hair done. I hate it. They mess about, they pull your hair, and it gives me a cracking headache. I actually had my hair done today, and I was in the hairdressers much longer than I anticipated because Morris, who does my hair beautifully put on this tint, and it starts to go a funny... My hair nearly went blue today, so uh, I was... Derek, no more challenge. Repetition of today. You said today, you oh, went today. early on. Yeah. Yes, early on. So, Derek, will you tell us something about having my hair done? Actually, you... I enjoy having my hair done greatly. I go to Trumpers, which is in German Street, and it's terribly soothing the way they sort of ruffle your hair and then cut it and wash it. And perhaps you might have, at the same time have a manicure, which is sort of... Uh, Alice and McGowan, Charles. Hesitation in there? I think so, yes, it also... Blah, blah, blah. And so there are 23 seconds for you, Alice, to tell us about having my hair done starting now. I've always hated having my hair done or cut or anything ever since I was a young child, and a boy at school called Craig Jones would always come up to me after having had the cut, and he'd run his fingers at the back uh, of my hair. We had two cuts. You had two cuts there, yes. You were going very fast, but she did pick it up. Good story. So, uh, Wendy, 14 seconds on having my hair done starting now. Quite often when I go home after having had my hair done, my husband never notices I've had my hair done. I find this very frustrating. He had his hair done on Saturday, and I told him how nice it looked. But today... <laughs> So, I think we're moving into the last round. Wendy Richard got a number of points in that round with her hair. She's in second place, only just behind Clement Freud. In comes Derek Nimmo, and then Alistair McGowan. And Derek, will you take this round? And the subject is video cameras. Will you tell us something about video cameras in just a minute, starting now? 
I got my first video camera from a man called Mr. Batia. He gave it to me as a present, as a matter of fact. I was sitting by the same swimming pool that I was sunbathing at the other day in Dubai about four years ago. And he sent an emissary to see me called Mr. Singh. And he said, I'd like to very much give you a video camera. And I was so moved. I thought it was quite the most extraordinary generous thing that ever happened to me. So I went back to visit the aforementioned Indian gentleman at his house. That's uh, uh, Clement Roy Challenge. Two gentlemen. So 30 seconds are left, Clement, and you have video cameras starting now. I always thought I'd be a rather good photographer, but I've never had a camera. It's very difficult to work out whether, in fact, this would be a question. Video cameras are sort of things my children give each other. But I'm not sure whether they're different video cameras or always the same one being passed from son to daughter. You can... Uh, Alistair McGowan challenge. Hesitation? Yes, I agree, Alistair. You've got nine seconds to tell us something about video cameras, Alistair, starting now. What bemuses me about people who possess these uh, video cameras? Clement Freud challenge. Deviation. He suddenly started speaking slowly. <laughs> You've got nine seconds. I was yes, to he's, out. He's, he's actually gaining confidence. Oh, right. We'll have to have you back when you speak slowly all the time. <laughs> that wasn't a correct challenge, so you have another point for that, Alistair. Six seconds on video cameras, starting now. I am bemused by people who point these cameras at things. You uh, just when said you... bemused the time before. Oh, but I was interrupted, wasn't I? But you were yes, amused I know, but you're not supposed you? to say it again because they've had me on that one. So. Yeah. <laughs> but the thing is, Alistair, you've never played the game before and you didn't know that, did you? No, I didn't. No, no, no you, benefit you, of the doubt, I think, really, Nicholas. I think that's what we're looking at here, isn't it? In fact... <laughs> but I won't do it again. No, no you won't um, do it again. Because if you've used the word before and then you've interrupted, you mustn't use it again. Okay. So you have four seconds to continue on video Just cameras a minute, starting. Don't I get a point? Because it was a correct uh, challenge, actually. All right, we'll give Wendy a point for a correct challenge. <laughs> and uh, Alistair a point for being interrupted, and he keeps the subject. Four seconds on video cameras starting now. They direct these things at items that... <laughs> <laughs> Hesitation. Yes, it was hesitation. You've got uh, a point for a correct challenge, but Alistair's going to finish the show for us. All right? Right. And, and you get a... And you get another point, actually, because uh, you didn't know that you couldn't hesitate in that particular way. <laughs> and there's only one second left, and don't hesitate again if you can help it. Video cameras starting now. Why direct them at things that don't actually move? <laughs> so, Alistair McGowan, with extreme skill at playing the game, kept going until the whistle went and gained that extra point for doing so. And he still finished up in fourth place, which I suppose <laughs> Derek finished in third place. And uh, then Wendy Richard, with lots of points, didn't quite overtake our leader. She finished two points behind Clement Freud, who is our winner this week. <laughs> we do hope that you have enjoyed this edition of Just a Minute and want to tune in again the same time next week. Until then, it only remains for me to say on behalf of our four excellent panellists and also Jane Stevens, who's been sitting beside me, blowing the whistle and keeping the score for me. Also our producer, Sarah Smith, and the creator of the game, Ian Messeter, and myself, Nicholas Parsons, from all of us. Until the next time, bye-bye. <laughs> Welcome to Just a Minute. Hello, my name is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute waltz fades away once more, it is my pleasure to introduce the four interesting and diverse personalities who this week are once more playing Just a Minute. Peter Jones, Derek Nimmo, Paul Merton and Clement Freud, will you please welcome all four of them? Once more, we have an enthusiastic audience here. So it's a great pleasure once more to be back in Clandidno. And once more, I'm going to ask our four players of the game if they will speak on the subject that I will give them. And they will try and do that without hesitation, repetition, or deviating from the subject. And we'll begin the show this week with Peter Jones. Peter, the subject is stocking. Can you tell us something about stocking in this game starting now. In olden days, a glimpse of stocking was looked upon as something shocking 
but now anything goes. <laughs> now, that's the first and only reference Paul I can Merton think of. Paul challenge very rapidly. Paul, um, it's a deviation from the lyric, now heaven knows. That's a, that, 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 is, that is the correct lyric, Paul, yes. but he didn't establish that he was actually quoting from the lyric. He just So just by sheer chance he said the same word? That's right, yes. <laughs> He decided to paraphrase the song, and I accept that as an incorrect challenge. You gain a point for that, of oh, course, exactly. and you have 50 seconds to continue on stocking starting now. Mrs Thatcher, as she then was, once used to hoard food when she thought there was going to be a crisis, and she recommended this to the nation. Of course, she called it uh, stocking. Derek Nemo challenge. She called it her uh, stocking. She did, her. She did. Mary, uh, Mary, stocking, yes. Mary said her stocking, did it? That's how I missed <laughs> no, her. No, no. Her no, no, you didn't. So you get a point for that, and you take over the subject. There are 37 seconds left, stocking starting now. There was a time when a lot of people used to actually put their money into a stocking because they thought it was the safest place to keep it. They didn't really trust banks or didn't have counts on those particular premises, and they used to bung the stockings up the chimney. Now, it always seemed to me to be rather curious because any self-respecting burglar would know that anyone who had a stocking full of loot, we're putting it up this thing above the fire. Uh, Paul Merton challenge. A repetition of up. Yes, you were putting too much up, Ben said. <laughs> <laughs> I thought for a moment you were talking about Ken Dodd, actually, but the. Um... Why would he want to shove Ken Dodd up a chimney? <laughs> anyway. 17 seconds for stocking Paul starting now. Every Christmas I would wake up eager to see on that particular morning what Santa had left for me in the stocking at the end of the bed. One... Mm. Oh. <laughs> Clement, you got in with a challenge. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> if that's well, your challenge, hesitation. it's incorrect. Hesitation, of course. Seven seconds for you, Clement, on stocking starting now. It's something you do on shelves in supermarkets if you wear an apron and are employed by the people. <laughs> Whoever is speaking when the whistle is blown gains an extra point, and it was on that occasion Clement Freud, so he is in the lead at the end of that round. And, Clement, it is your turn to begin. Roast duck. Will you tell us something about that delicacy in this game starting now? It's a very odd thing that people of my sort of age think that roast duck, because it was a post-war delicacy, is now totally inedible. The sad thing is that after 1945, the only celebratory food that was given in restaurants and hotels was roast duck. And it used to be served with sour cherries or peaches or other totally unrelated and badly fitting foods in order that it should be... Pumba. What should Challenge. we say? Right, Paul. 31 seconds for you to tell us something about roast duck starting now. The way I like to roast a duck is bung it in the oven for four hours and then take it out on when it's been on maximum regular eight. And it's very crisp at that point. It's wonderful. It's like eating old rubber and I love it. In fact, when I get a bit of a sort of sprain in my shoe... A sprain in my shoe? No, I don't mean a sprain in my shoe at all. <laughs> Repetition of a sprain. A sprain in my shoe, yes, yes, you see. Should have drawn attention to it, should have kept going that day. Well, I think somebody would have noticed if I hadn't drawn attention. <laughs> Clement, you'll have the subject back. 16 seconds, roast duck starting now. A duck is a very badly designed animal, also a bugger to pluck. Incredibly <laughs> difficult to... Derek Nimmo challenged. I don't think you can say words like that on this show. <laughs> Are you using Cockney rhyming slang? <laughs> <laughs> It certainly sounds like it. Yeah. <laughs> so what is your challenge, Jerry? Deviation. Bugging a duck out there. <laughs> <laughs> and this I... was a post-war delicacy, was it? <laughs> <laughs> Mr Jones. Chairman, uh, on a point of order. Yes. <laughs> However you describe the plucking business, you can't actually pluck a roast duck at all. <laughs> Because it's already been planned. You're a bit late with your challenge. Well, all these other people were waffling on. And, uh... <laughs> Derek, I think that was deviation, so... Explain yes. that. <laughs> well, I don't wish to go into the detail. It is far too embarrassing. And so, Derek, I give you the benefit of the doubt and nine seconds on roast duck starting now. I think roast duck is marginally more edible than cold turkey and much more pleasant when one thinks about it. I like it particularly with kumquats. Those sweet little orange...
So Derek Nimmo is now one point ahead of Clement Freud in the lead, and then comes Peter Jones and Paul Merton, equal in third place. Peter, your turn to begin, and the subject is who I would like to be. And you have 60 seconds in which to tell us something about that, starting now. I think I'd like to be the Prince of Wales, because he's so incredibly gifted. He's able to play the cello and make a speech in French and ride a horse. He can pilot an airplane. Uh, I know he has a number of difficult relatives, but Derek who doesn't? <laughs> Derek Chapman. Hesitation. Because there was a hesitation often. I'm not surprising if you wish to gain any more honours. I do. Given uh, up long ago. Derek Nimmer, you have the subject, you have 45 seconds, and you can tell us now something about who I would like to be starting now. I would like to be Sir Clement Freud, this distinguished former politician, knight bachelor, married to the most wonderful wife, Jill, and of course, father to the divine Emma. Clement Freud challenged. Hesitation. Yes, yes. <laughs> I would have let him go on. He was saying such nice things about you. Why would I hesitate? Clement, it was a hesitation, so you have 34 seconds for you to tell us something about who I would like to be starting now. I'd actually rather like to be Derek Nimmo, who's <laughs> enormously grand rich, has chauffeurs and butlers and flats and houses... Derek Nimmo has just bought a chateau. Paul Merton has challenged. A repetition of Derek Nimmo. Paul, would you tell us something about who I would like to be? And there are 23 seconds starting now. I would like to be a roast duck in post-war Britain. <laughs> because it sounds like you had a right old time indeed. Not only could you look forward to being basted in the oven, but there was the pre-buggery beforehand. <laughs> which was just to be such fun and enjoyment as you realised that this was indeed to be your fate Clement in Freud life. has challenged you. I think yeah. it's... Establish that this deviation. <laughs> I think we're giving ourselves incredible problems about our future in radio here because. Uh... <laughs> I think it's a new quiz show in this. Yes, I think so. How far can you go? <laughs> uh, Whose to... duck is it anyway? <laughs> Lined duck. You yeah. could have contestants lined up behind yeah. the screen and have to pick a duck going. to go out with. <laughs> duck of the century. <laughs> Dixon of duck green. <laughs> Clement Freud had said that it was what he was trying to do to the duck, which was out. And, um, Sounds like a perfect evening, a bit of sex and a meal afterwards. <laughs> So, have you got any more titles before we carry on, Paul? Oh, there's a few more, but I think we'll leave it there. Right, yes. Clement, I disagree with the challenge, so, uh, Paul... <laughs> <laughs> so, Paul continues with nine seconds on who I would like to be starting now. I would like to be Max Sennett, that Hollywood pioneer of silent comedy who worked in America... Derek Nimmo challenged. Well, you couldn't be. He'd never stop talking long enough. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that Paul's a great verbaliser and has a great gift with words has got nothing to do with the fact that he'd like to have been a great pioneer of comedy. And Paul is, in many ways, a great <laughs> pioneer of comedy. I think I've broken through the duck barrier, anyway. <laughs> And you have another point as well, and three seconds to go on who I would like to be starting now. There was a number of comedians who worked... <laughs> Clement Freud Challenge. Deviation. There were a number of comedians. Oh, I think that's pedantic. And the audience, you agree, don't you? Yes. <laughs> you could have had him for a repetition of comedian, but unfortunately you didn't. There's half a second for you, Paul, having got another point, starting now. Charlie... <laughs> Well, Paul Merton got a lot of points in that round, but he's still only in third place. Peter Jones is a uh, little behind him, and but one ahead is Clement Freud, and one ahead of him, Derek Nimmer, who's in the lead. And, Paul, it's your turn to begin. We're going to hear from you again. Now, guess what the next subject is? Who I would hate to be. <laughs> there are 60 seconds, as usual, starting now. I would hate to be a roast duck, because nothing puts my <laughs> back out there. I mean, I couldn't put up with it at all. I would hate to be walking through the fields and the forest, and suddenly here comes a hunter shooting at me and end up on somebody's plate later that night. Oh, that wouldn't be any good to me at all. I'd be much happier being some Somebody like, um, oh, I don't know, Abraham Lincoln. Peter Jones, a challenge. He said someone like, um, Abraham He did Lincoln. indeed, he uh, yes. that's hesitation. Peter, another point to you, and 42 seconds for you to tell us something about who I would hate to be starting.
starting now. Well, I'd hate to be. You don't remember challenge. Sorry, he always starts with well, but he hasn't started so. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's a reflex action. I'm he sorry. always starts with well, but as long as he doesn't repeat well when he starts again, it's all right. Mm, yes. So, Peter, you have another point for an incorrect challenge. 41 seconds. Who I would hate to be starting now? I'd hate to be Max Sennett. Uh, that and challenge. Deviation. He didn't start oh, with, with well. well. <laughs> <laughs> We've established he always does, and he didn't. Right. A point to Paul. Um, Peter, you were interrupted. A point to you. You carry on. 40 seconds. Who I would hate to be starting now? Well, he's dead, for one thing. <laughs> Very good, Mitch. Well. well, I know when well. he fell it before, so I thought I'd just put it in. Oh, I see. Well. Double bluff. Double bluff. <laughs> Yes, it didn't work. I'm sorry, Peter. You did repeat the word and Derek picked you up. 38 seconds for Derek on who I would hate to be starting now. I would hate to be Emma Freud because I'd have as my father, Sir Clement, that awful bearded ogre who makes so many people feel uncomfortable, frightens them, terrifies them. And one of the people... Oh, she is such... Clement Freud challenge. Repetition of people. Yes, there were too many people there. <laughs> for 26 seconds, who I would hate to be starting now. I would hate to be a marriage guidance counsellor to the royal family. <laughs> because I would have to sell my stories to tabloid newspapers and embarrass nice people. They're not of other people I wouldn't much like to be. Peter Jones a challenge. A repetition of people. Yes. 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 You said people before, yes. Clement, and there are four seconds for Peter Jones who got in then on who I would hate to be starting now. Paul Merton, whose ambition it is to invent silent films. <laughs> Well, at the end of that round, it's a very close contest because equal in third place, Peter Jones and Paul Merton. They're only one point behind Clement Freud and he's only one point behind Anita, who is still Derek Nimmo. And Derek, your turn to begin. The subject, Q. You can take it any way you like, as you know, and you have 60 seconds and you start now. Of course, you can have a billiard cue, but it's not a game I really like very much, so I won't talk about that, I don't think. In China, before Sun Yat-sen came to power, they used to wear pigtails, which they called cues. But when this new regime started, they were all forced to cut them off and say, well, masses of these little long black bits of hair lying all around the pavement. It's a very curious thing altogether. Uh, but the English are very good at queuing. It is surprising that when you go to a chain store, they form themselves into an orderly line and go one after another to the counter to gasp for whatever... Paul Merton challenge. Repetition of two. Yeah, to the counter two. Right. <laughs> Never mind. <I'm> just... <laughs> <laughs> Paul, 22 seconds with you on cue starting now. I went to the doctor the other day and I said to him, I feel like a billiard ball, and he said, get on the end of the queue. <laughs> Which is a fair enough comment because I had barged in front of other people. I used to play snooker with Elacrity, who was a friend of mine, Bert Elacrity. I've said Elacrity twice, I've said it four <laughs> times. Clement Freud challenge. Repetition. Yes, too much Alacrity, I'm sorry. Five seconds only on Q starting now. Q is the top left hand letter of a standard keyboard, followed by W. -E so Clement Freud has taken the lead at the end of that round with the extra points he gained, and Clement, it's your turn to begin. The subject is ginger. Will you tell us something about ginger in this game, starting now? There was a Victorian song which went, Ginger, ginger, they all know Captain Ginger. Jolly old pot, oaty ot, 95 in the shade, what? And that word would be repeated, which I cannot do here. Ginger is a wonderful substance in cooking. I feel that ginger with sesame oil, onion, perhaps garlic, but above all, lemon juice gives and enhances food to an unqualified degree. There are many Chinese and Thai restaurants who serve not only ginger, but also chili pepper, which in Thai is called prick. It's very embarrassing, should you be in Bangkok, having to say, please may I have some more of this condiment. But <laughs> lemongrass is also an excellent thing to have. There are gingery restaurants all... Peter Jones, a challenge. Hesitation. He paused a long time. It was shocked reaction, actually. <laughs> there was a repetition of restaurants. I know there was, but he didn't challenge for that. No, but I've just done. 
But Peter got in first. I disagree with the challenge, actually, Peter. So Clement has to keep the subject, even though Paul's challenge was correct. Mind you, it doesn't mean to say you can't challenge later. Twelve seconds left, starting now. Candied, caramelised. Uh, Paul Merton, you challenge. Repetition of restaurants. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Ten seconds for that Paul. That was one Mer of the most bizarre rulings I've ever come across. What? <laughs> did you challenge him a repetition of restaurant? Yes, I did. And he did repeat restaurant. He did. That's right. But you wouldn't give it to me before. But he, you, <laughs> let's, let's get the. Let's, I mean, there are simple rules which we follow. Yeah. He did have restaurants. Nicholas, in an earlier programme, you accused me of living in a world of my own. Yeah. <laughs> I tried to live in the world of just a minute, which is particularly difficult. Making these obtuse uh, decisions on <laughs> obtuse and obtuse. <laughs> I tactfully suggested you could challenge later. You did challenge later. You got in there with another repetition of David and then Clement Freud is right. So actually, I'm entitled now to say to you, yes, that is right, because Clement Freud did believe restaurants before, and so on. You can get a point for a correct challenge to take oh, away from Clement Freud. He's you take a point for the ten seconds. Finally, and finished. therefore, you now. <laughs> ten seconds on Ginger, starting now. Could I have that last ruling in writing? <laughs> Clement Freud challenge. Yes, it is. Yes, indeed. Right, Clement, you have the subject back again. <laughs> There are nine seconds on ginger starting now. Candied, caramelised, preserved, crystallised. There's virtually no form of ginger which is not entirely delicious. And Paul Merton challenge. Steve Gage, what about radioactive ginger? <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't be delicious. That's a form of ginger. <laughs> uh, can I say they repeated restaurants as well, if that helps? <laughs> You've got a point for that already. Pimmer, I don't think that's the correct challenge. Uh, you have another point. <laughs> Oh, I could give up. You know. <laughs> one point and one second to go, Ginger, starting now. Hotels and cafeterias. <laughs> Clement Freud got a number of points in that round and has increased his lead. And, uh, Peter Jones, it's your turn to begin. The subject, pairs. And there are 60 seconds, as usual, starting now. When you're making some of these decisions, I imagine the programme going out on the radio and I can see millions of hands all over the world reaching for the on-off switch <laughs> and extinguishing this programme forever. <laughs> pairs. <laughs> before you said pairs... No, a little diatribe. There was a, he hesitated before. Hesitation he, he hadn't mentioned stops. pairs at all, really. And uh, pairs is with you, Derek, and 44 seconds are left, starting now. Noah, when he actually called the animals to the ark, had a very good idea when he asked them to come along in pairs, because that was quite necessary for breeding purposes after the floods had disappeared. And they all went up to... Paul Merton Challenge. Surely Noah didn't ask the animals to come along in pairs. He yeah. sort of just picked pairs. He didn't sort of say to a couple of hedgehogs, right, just two of you, please. <laughs> And I can't imagine that all the pears waited until the water had evaporated before they started breeding. That's, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> Nothing else to do on board. <laughs> so, so you've been on a cruise yourself, have you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Was there two roast duck on this cruise? <laughs> Oh, yes. Um, there are 28 seconds for you, Derek, and to continue starting now. Pear is a particularly nice form of fruit. It goes tapering to the top and rather bulbous beneath. What I can never understand is how they put them into a pear Wilhelm bottle. I suppose they must actually put the bottle... Over Clement Freud challenge. Hesitation. Yes, I think that was hesitation. And 15 seconds. Clement starting now. Grated ginger is an awfully good thing to have with pears. <laughs> Pears cooked in red wine is a speciality of many restaurants and the best way to prepare them is to get some water and add sugar and lemon rind. Well, at the end of that round, uh, Clement Foy was speaking as the whistle went, gained an extra point. He's increased his lead. Second place is Derek Nimmo. Paul, it's your turn to begin. The subject is loans. Will you tell us something about that subject in this game, starting now? Whenever I'm short of money, I go into the sea and borrow some off a loan shark. These peculiar <laughs> creatures carry great big wads of cash around with them. They are, in fact, known as the uh, loan money lenders of the sea. And when I am down in this particular briny piece of water, I see them swimming past with 
fivers sticking out of their spout holes, but they don't have those, of course, because I'm thinking of whales, but that's something else entirely, and everybody's going to carry on let me talking now, and I'm just going to talk gibberish for the next minute and a half. <laughs> Pears are my favourite fruit, because beyond a doubt, um, there is something about a pear that I absolutely <laughs> love. And if I haven't got enough money to buy a pair, I will go down to the bank and I say, excuse me, can you give me a loan because I simply must have more of this particular fruit? And they say, of course, and here's a thousand pounds. So I go down to the greengrocers, I say, look, I've got a thousand pounds. He said, yeah, a thousand pounds, actually, is about <laughs> He said, how many pairs have you got? He said, well, for that amount of money. He said, you did say a thousand. I said, I did, yeah. He said, well, I could give you, I could give you about 8,000 pairs for that because they are about eight pounds um, each. So, said, well, that's not right, is it? Because, I mean, if they were eight pairs a pound, that would be 8,000 for a thousand. But he said, you are right. He says, but I didn't do algebra at school and um, I'm very pleased that you've come here now to uh, my shop because with this money, I can have a holiday. <laughs> Well, for the listeners, I must tell you, that was a bit of naughtiness on the part of the other three players. They decided to let Paul Merton go, and just to prove to us all he does live in a world of his own, and... Uh... <laughs> Yeah, everything. <laughs> Absolutely everything. You went for one minute, 20 seconds. <laughs> you get a point for uh, speaking when the whistle went, eventually, and also a point for not being interrupted, so you have two points for that. Derek, it's now your turn to begin. The subject is robbing Peter to pay Paul. That's a good subject for this show, isn't it? <laughs> Starting now. Well, it actually really means sort of moving around so you never have to actually settle a debt. <laughs> Clement Freud challenge. Two actuallys. Two actuallys, yes, indeed, yes. Clement, you have the subject, another point. 53 seconds, robbing Peter to pay Paul, starting now. Unless Peter is reasonably well healed, there wouldn't be a lot in it for Paul, is what I can't help thinking. But Peter is sitting over there, and Paul on this side. I think it ought um, to be Paul up to Merton them challenge. to discuss this subject. Hesitation. Yes, right? you're getting so boring. I'm awfully pleased you're challenged. The... Um, <laughs> You have 39 seconds to try and tell us something about robbing Peter to pay Paul starting now. Peter Jones owed me £1,000 for a pear venture that we went into several years ago. And I kept asking him for this money and he wouldn't give it to me. So in the end, I went round to his house and I took goods for the appropriate amount. I took a video recorder and his television set and I have them now at home and I'm very happy with them indeed. It was a 12-inch screen, I believe, and the video came compatible with NICAM Digital Stereo, which is one of these great new inventions. Why you want to hear people talking in NICAM Digital Stereo? <laughs> Derry, a Nemo challenge. My God. Yes, a repetition. There are eight seconds and left for you, Derry, to tell us something about robbing Peter to pay Paul starting when now. When the Abbey Church of St Peter was accorded the rank of a cathedral, the lands were taken away and given to St Paul's. And that is why uh, the expression... Paul Merton challenged. Repetition of saint. Yes, there were two saints there, Derek. So yes, Paul well. Merton's got in very cleverly with only half a second to go starting now. Yes, Clement Freud challenged. What is your challenge, Clement? He hesitated. <laughs> You're being very generous, because you're in the league, because he gets another point for that. Of course he didn't hesitate. Quarter of a second to go, robbing Peter to pay Paul, starting now. <laughs> So, we're moving into the last round now, so let me give you the score before we do, because it's very close. Clement Freud is still in the lead, but only just ahead of Paul Merton, and then Derek Nimmo, and then Peter Jones. And, Clement, your turn to begin the subject, this audience. <laughs> and as I look at them, oh, what lovely, charming Welsh faces they all have. <laughs> Will you tell us something about this audience, Clement, in this game, starting now? This audience is just the... Nicest, warmest, prettiest, <laughs> hottest, most fanning, supportive bunch of people I've come across this side of Prestatin. <laughs> I haven't encountered human being. Derek Nimmo challenge. I hesitate. 41 seconds are left uh, for you, Derek, on this audience starting now. Well, I can honestly say, having played the game for 25 years, that the audience here tonight has rarely been quite exceptional. Without any doubt at all, and I mean this most sincerely, they're the most filthy-minded audience <laughs> we've ever played. I'm proud of it to boot. <laughs> 
Paul, you challenged. Repetition of most. Paul, you have another point and, and uh, 31 seconds to tell us something about this audience starting now. Nicholas told me a few minutes ago that he is so pleased with this audience he's invited them all up to his hotel room <laughs> for a roast duck supper. <laughs> And when the people in the front row heard this, they couldn't wait to book their seats, and they rushed out to find out from the receptionist which room Nicholas... Uh, uh, <laughs> Clement Freud challenge. Repetition of room. <laughs> yes, the repetition of my room, yes, indeed. We can't get them all in there. Um, I wouldn't mind one or two of them coming up, I mean... <laughs> or one at a time, I mean... I... One at a time? <laughs> at your age? <laughs> There must be about 400 people here. Can't you just be satisfied with the front row? <laughs> so, anyway, um, Clement, you have 12 seconds to tell us something more about this audience starting now. Can I compare this audience to a summer's day? <laughs> I think, on the whole... A Paul Merton would... challenge. Deviation, no, you can't. <laughs> They're a very warm audience, aren't they? <laughs> In every sense of the word. I mean, they're <coughs> fanning themselves. Clement, I disagree with the challenge. You have another point and eight seconds on this audience starting now. This audience is about to leave this hall because it is time for them to wend their weary way towards Prescott. <laughs> Well, that was a very apt and delightful subject on which to finish this edition of Just a Minute. And let me give you the final score. Peter Jones finished just in fourth place behind Derek Nimmo. Then came Paul Merton. He didn't manage to overtake Clement Freud. So we adjudge him to be the winner of the show this week. <laughs> Hope all our listeners have enjoyed this edition of Just a Minute as much as we've enjoyed playing it. We do thank our four players of the game for their contributions. I thank James Stevens for blowing the whistle magnificently and also keeping the score. We thank Ian Messeter, who created the game, and our producer, Sarah Smith. This is Nicholas Parsons saying to you all, goodbye. This is Radio 4. The time now is half past six. Welcome to Just a Minute. Hey! Hello. My name is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute waltz fades away once more, it is my pleasure to welcome the four interesting and varied personalities who this week are going to play just a minute. We welcome back three of our regulars, which is Peter Jones, Clement Freud and Paul Merton, and we welcome someone who has never played the game before, Jim Sweeney. Would you please welcome all four of them? <laughs> Beside me sits Jane Stevens with a stopwatch and a pencil to keep the score. And as usual, I will ask our four competitors to speak on the subject that I give them, and they will try and do that without hesitation, repetition, or deviating from the subject. And let us begin the show this week with Paul Merton and Paul the Subject Splits. Will you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? I remember when I was a child at the infant school, some of the other children could do the splits. This consisted of pushing one foot as far apart from the other as is G and Judy. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and Peter Jones' challenge? Uh, hesitation. Yes, it took a long time to make up your mind. You hesitated a long time. But there was no doubt about it. It was a definite hesitation, Peter. There are 48 seconds left, starting now. There have been a number of splits this past year. Donald Trump and his wife and, of course, innumerable members of the royal family have broken up and are, as they say in America, Reno-bound. This seems rather sad when you look back on each month of the year, and I could go through January, February, and March, but I won't do that because I think it's very incredibly boring. <laughs> Unless, of course, I change the order. That might make a bit of a difference. 
but splits as such are sad affairs and they um... uh... Clement Freud challenged hesitation yes I hesitated yes Clement. I think you could yes. say that Clement you have 13 seconds to tell us something about splits starting now splits I'm almost certain is a small picturesque resort town <laughs> in what used to be <laughs> Yugoslavia and was then Montenegro I have been offered a fortnight in Split. And before people start writing in from Yugoslavia and Bosnia and places, it is actually Split, not Splits, I think, um, Clement. We do get letters, and I wanted to prevent them all flooding into you. I um, they've probably got better things on their mind in Bosnia than... <laughs> <laughs> writing letters about just the minute. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whoever is... Consider the fact that this programme might be the cause of a lot of trouble. <laughs> How did you guess, Paul? It all happened once you joined it. <laughs> Whoever is speaking when the whistle goes gains an extra point, and on this occasion it was Clement Freud. And Clement, the subject... Edward II, would you tell us something about that king starting now? Edward II was the son of Edward I, and his own progeny later became Edward III, which is how it went in the 14th century. He was a bad king. He was born in Carnarvon. He succeeded to the throne at the age of 23, and he was murdered by his wife Isabella, having previously lost the Battle of Bannockburn, where there's still a statue showing what a rotten monarch he was <laughs> and how <laughs> difficult the... Uh, Paul Merton challenged. Hesitation. No, I don't think he hesitated. No, no. no I think he was keeping going quite well. Giving us a fascinating history lesson all about Edward II. Uh, obviously did it for his school cert. Um, <laughs> Clement, you have 28 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Having got a point for an incorrect challenge and you continue starting now. There was a horse called Edward II which won the... Lo uh, Peter Jones has challenged. Hesitation. No. <laughs> <laughs> won the... Uh, you couldn't, couldn't remember what he'd won. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Clement, another incorrect challenge. 24 seconds, Edward II, starting now. It is quite a popular... Uh, uh, Jim McSweeney's challenged. Hesitation. Well, everybody else is doing it, so I thought I'd have a go. <laughs> And as you haven't played the game before, Jim, I will agree with yours. <laughs> <laughs> and there are 23 seconds for you to tell us something about Edward II, Jim, starting now. The story... Uh, Clement <laughs> Floyd Challenge. Repetition. <laughs> of what? I don't know. <laughs> Clement is doing his generous thing for first-time guests. You've got a point for an incorrect challenge. And you have 22 seconds, your point, and Edward II starting now. The story of Edward II is one that's always fascinated me when it has been told to me. Sadly, it was only the once given to me as a story, which I have... Uh, Paul, yeah. your Paul, your challenge? Uh, repetition of a story. story. Correct. 14 seconds, Edward II starting now. I don't know a single thing about Edward II. <laughs> that... uh, Peter Jones, a challenge. He must shut up. <laughs> No, he hadn't even learned something from no. Clement. <laughs> <laughs> At least uh, we know that. He lost the Battle of Bannockburn he... and his wife murdered him. It was Ella Bella's lover who actually did the murdering. Was it? Yeah, but it doesn't matter. The, um... The... <laughs> well, it mattered to him, didn't it? <laughs> yes. Paul didn't actually hesitate, deviate... He admitted that he didn't know a single thing about Edward VI. Listen, there's people in just a minute over the years haven't known a single thing about some of the subjects, and yet they've kept talking about them, including yourself. But Nicholas... <laughs> yes? Yes, but I make it he interesting. He heard when he was born. <laughs> I don't see how you can listen to 40 seconds on Edward II and then say, I don't know a single thing about Edward II. <laughs> Quite. I think it's a very good challenge. No, I think I've got to be fair within the rules of just a minute. I'm with you. You have ten seconds to continue on Edward II starting now. Isabella's lover, Fred, was in fact the one who murdered... <laughs> Peter Jones' challenge. His name wasn't Fred. <laughs> he was Fred to her. <laughs> His name wasn't Fred, I'm sorry, Paul. So Peter has got a correct challenge. And five seconds on Edward II, starting now. The Scots have never forgotten this famous victory over this poor, inadequate king. <laughs> right.
Right, so Peter Jones was then speaking as the whistle went and gained an extra point. And, Jim, it is your turn to begin. The subject is commercials. Will you tell us something about those in just a minute, starting now? The subject of commercials is one which divides the acting community into two camps, one who believe it's a valuable and worthwhile way of earning money, others who think it's the moral equivalent of touting for business at Piccadilly. I happen to fall in the first camp. I believe that it is a well worth... <laughs> Uh, Paul Merton challenge. The repetition of camp, unfortunately. Yes, yes, I know. We can't get to Pardon camp me. on this show, right. <laughs> 46 seconds for you to tell us something about commercials, Paul, starting now. I always felt sorry for the actor who had to stand next to a great big ball of Edam with a keyboard cut into it and sing the Jerry Lee Lewis song. <laughs> <laughs> Peter Jones a challenge. He just became incoherent. <laughs> <laughs> I know, so we call that hesitation, Peter. Yes. Right. 35 seconds for you to tell us something about commercials starting now. They're made so well, it's my ambitious to be... For <laughs> <laughs> Merton challenge. Deviation, my ambitious. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's catching, isn't it? You're sitting next to each other and you're giving this uh, incoherence of phraseology and words to each other. Right, 32 seconds. I wonder where we pick it up from. <laughs> I think you're wicked sometimes. <laughs> now, how I cope with you. 32 seconds, uh, Paul, on commercials starting now. I always use Jacob's household paints because when it comes to painting the house, there's nothing quite like the aforementioned product. It's great. I dip my brush in it and whack it across the wall and then sometimes I go up to the ceiling and if I'm in a particularly generous mood, I will do the floor as well. My wife will come in and say, Mmm, what a lovely smell. You can tell it and it is. <laughs> Peter, you challenge. Well, that was a hesitation. He kept going with a mm. slogan. You can tell it's mmm. <laughs> it's on all the tins. You see? And as they say sometimes, I think he was rather riding the laugh. So I'll be generous <laughs> to you, Paul, riding and say you laugh. have another... <laughs> <laughs> It's a phrase that came up in the, one of the early recordings of this series about... Uh, 25 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, you have seven seconds to continue on commercial starting now. I believe, as Jim mentioned earlier, that there are two very distinct ways of looking... <laughs> So Paul Merton was speaking as the whistle went, gained that extra point, and uh, he has increased his lead at the end of the round. And, Paul, your turn to begin. The subject, grouse. Will you tell us something about that subject in this game starting now? A grouse can always often be... Oh, I don't know. Can I start again? <laughs> <laughs> you can't. I'm no good starting off. I, I start off with I've got an idea within my head, and I go ahead and say it. I know. Dreadful. I know. It sounds like it sometimes, too. <laughs> Uh, Jim, you have got in with a correct challenge. Yes, hesitation-ish. With 57 seconds on, a, on grouse starting now. When I think of grouse, one particular famous grouse comes to mind, one that I have known and enjoyed several times when I've walked into bars up and down the country and indeed savoured at great length, several times ending up sitting on the floor singing songs by ABBA, <laughs> dressed in somebody else's clothes and wishing that I could somehow find a cab to take me home. But sadly, I never can. This is why I stopped some years ago indulging in that particular brand of grouse, although it gives me still some thoughts of... Uh, Paul Merton, Charlie. Well, this is a commercial that he's doing. <laughs> He's hoping to get a crate of the whiskey from that firm delivered after this uh, yeah. show's transmitted. Deviation. He said particular brand of grouse, and it's a brand of whiskey rather than a brand of grouse. Grouse is a brand. Oh, yes, Ooh. all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I suppose you're, you're technically correct, Paul, yes, but you had... I was going to give him the benefit of the doubt as he hadn't played the game before. I think I will, in fact. Right, Jim. <laughs> It was a tough challenge. Uh, you've got 29 seconds to continue. Try, try not to advertise too much. I mean, if you're going to get the whiskey, you'll, you'll get it now, anyway. <laughs> 29 seconds, Grouse, starting now. I have... Uh, Paul Merton challenge. <laughs> Hesitation, but give him the benefit no, of the doubt. <laughs> <laughs> All right.
right. Paul wants Jim to have another point. So there are 28 seconds on grouse, uh, Jim, starting now. I've never really known what a grouse looked like. I've often had a picture of what it could possibly be, something very small and slightly feathery with little feet, but I never really knew what it was. Uh, uh, Peter Jones, a chance. Repetition of really. Yeah. Yes, he really didn't know. 19 seconds for you to take over grouse, starting now, Peter. Some people enjoy shooting grouse. I've never done that myself. I don't feel it's something that would be appropriate. Now, just like uh, initials on one's pyjamas or having a personalised number plate on the car, it's not something I can identify with. Shooting these birds and being photographed with hundreds uh, of these corpses around on the ground. <laughs> Paul Merton challenge you, actually. Repetition of shooting. Yeah, you were shooting too much there. You were shooting off your head there. About <laughs> oh, yes. You, you were making a point, which the audience appreciated, but I'm afraid in Quite. just a minute we have to play by the I rules. I was playing to the animal rights group at the back. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, they don't move to the front. Or well, right, so there are only one second left on Grouse with you, Paul. Only one second. I know, you got him one second ago. Oh, food Starting food. now. The glorious... <laughs> <laughs> So, speaking as a whistle, when Paul Merton got the extra point, has increased his lead, then comes Clement Freud, and then equal, just behind them, Jim Sweeney and Peter Jones. Clement, your turn to begin the subject, Double Glazing Salesman. Will you talk on it in this game, starting now? There are very few Double Glazing Salesmen whom I know intimately, but thinking about it, there is Alistair, Bill, Charlie, Desmond, Edward, George, Frederick... Harry, Ivor, Jack, <laughs> Leonard, Martin, Norman, Oliver, Peter, Quentin, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> He had to slip up at some point. Yes. Right, Paul, you challenged. Hesitation. You waited and got in first. Right. 33 seconds. Double glazing salesman starting now. I don't see many double glazing salesmen round my way. I suppose it's because most people in my street already have double glazing. It was a big fad in the 1970s. People would look out of the window. There would be the double glazing salesman with his double glazing van and his cheery double glazing cry. It's glazing and it's double. Came a Freud challenge. <laughs> Repetition of people. Yes, there was. A, a oh, people. that was ages ago. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, I didn't want to do a lot of work for this point. It's sort of generosity on his part. How reason? can it be generous to interrupt when there's less time left on the watch? <laughs> yes, that's another clever ploy of Clement Freud's. He's been playing the game for 26 years, you know. Has he really? Mm. 14 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> clever double glazing salesman starting now. Sylvester Thomas, <laughs> Munich, Victor, William, Eve. And Zebekiah. Uh, Peter Jones challenge. Well, Eve isn't a man. It is. <laughs> Eve Monton. <laughs> that sort of Eve. Yes, but he's not a double glazed himself. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, the recession's hit, you know. It's bad. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he meant the other E, 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 yes. And so, Peter, you have six seconds on double glazing salesman starting oh, now. However good an uh, salesman <laughs> is. <laughs> What? However good you are, you mustn't hesitate, Peter. No, I do. And Paul got in with three seconds. Double glazing salesman starting now. Peter, William, George, Harry, Margaret, all these people. <laughs> Well, Paul Merton again speaking as a whistle when gained an extra point, has increased his lead. And Jim Sweeney, your turn to begin. The subject, Pisa. Will you tell us something about that beautiful place starting now? <laughs> Whenever I think of Pisa, I remember being a child and reading magazines like the Beano or periodicals of that kind, as we called them periodicals in the class I was in where we couldn't speak properly, <laughs> where there'd always be a cartoon where Corky the cat would go somewhere, like a little town in Italy, where he would see an unsteady pile of pizzas and they would say it was the leaning tower of that particular... Uh, uh, Peter challenged. Well, Peter Jones. Uh, repetition. Of what? Something or other. <laughs> <laughs> right at the beginning, he did repeat the word periodical. Yes, he did, very quickly. Yes. <laughs> he said periodical, then he said periodical again. That's right, but yes. I thought I'd give him a sporting chance yeah, since right, he hasn't yes. played it before. With my and help. then he repeated something else. 
and right. I felt it was getting a bit Benefit tedious. of the doubt. Mm. Yes. Yes. yes, that's what I thought. 41 seconds, Peter, you made your point. Pisa, starting now. The Leaning Tower of Pisa, in my view, is popular because it's flawed, it's imperfect. And I think if the Queen could market the castle at Windsor as being half burnt down, it might <laughs> do even better than it did before. But it's a question of getting the advertising right. And I think she's probably uh, capable of doing it because she's handled the last uh, week or two quite... Uh, uh, Paul Merton challenge. Uh, hesitation. Oh, there was a lot of hesitation. Yes, Paul. 17 seconds for you to tell us something about Pisa starting now. The Leaning Tower at Pisa has been closed for the past four or five years because the Italians are rather worried that it's in fact leaning too much. And they have banned tourists from climbing up the stairs and experiencing the lean for themselves. I... <laughs> Once again, Paul managed to keep going and spoke when the whistle went and has increased his lead at the end of the round. And, Paul, it is your turn to begin. Elitism. Will you tell us something about that subject in this game starting now? There are many people who have a rather high view of themselves and regard themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Jim. You... Repetition themselves? <laughs> yes, definitely, Jim. So, uh, it's very interesting, Paul. You know, so often you have difficulty starting, but once mm. you've started, there's no holding you, is there? Mm. Should have been there on the honeymoon. <laughs> <laughs> Had a good set of jump leads. <laughs> yeah. Right, Jim, you got in. Uh, with 53 seconds to go, the subject's elitism starting now. Elitist attitudes pervade our entire society. People who will sit round and say that people shouldn't watch programmes like El Dorado. And I've said people twice, and that's the third time I've said it. And then they're letting me get away with it. God bless them all. Because this is the first time <laughs> I've been on this programme, which shows there's been no elitist attitude as regards this particular show, which I'm enjoying now. Elitism, of course, is something that I hate and abhor, that people should decide that one thing is good and one thing is bad without allowing other people to make up their own... <laughs> Did I say people? I think... <laughs> <laughs> Repetition of people. Oh, yes. <laughs> Being sponsored Incessantly, by that word. yes. 28 seconds for you to tell us something about elitism, Paul, starting now. People who need people. <laughs> I can afford it. Challenged. Repetition. Oh. <laughs> Thought you were going to have him for deviation for his singing. The uh, 25 seconds... <laughs> <laughs> on elitism with you, Clement, starting now. I think one of the best poems about elitism is Hilaire Belloc's Garden Party, in which the poor arrived in Fords, whose features they resembled. They laughed to see so many lords and ladies all assembled. The middle class was there looking underdone and harassed, and very out of place uh, and Peter horribly Jones, embarrassed. Hesitation. Yes, I agree, there was a hesitation, Peter. You're going to tell us something about elitism, and you have seven seconds left starting now. People tend to associate it with those members of the audience of ballet performances and opera. <laughs> so, Peter Jones was then speaking on The Whistle Went. And, Clement, it's your turn to begin. The subject, witchcraft. Will you tell us something about that subject in this game, starting now? There's absolutely nothing elitist about witchcraft. You just get an ordinary witch in a conical hat, stick on a hoover, and claim a free flight to America. <laughs> Paul Merton challenge. A sort of full stop, really. Yes. <laughs> Witchcraft is now with you, Paul, and you have 46 seconds to tell us something about it, starting now. When shall we three meet again? In thunder, lightning, or in rain. So intone the three weird... Peter Jones has challenged. If there's anybody superstitious, they're going to be terribly worried by that because it's quite wrong to um, uh, quote from that Scottish play. And what will happen to the show now he's quoted? He's supposed to go outside and turn round three times and do something else. I forget what. I, I'm not superstitious myself. And uh, I don't mind him uh, reading the entire text of Macbeth if he wants to. But it is very Are you unlucky. speaking in the game or are you just telling us? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just giving you a bit of extra information. Oh, I see. Right. Fine. Well, Background detail. No. Anyway, Peter, I agree with your challenge. You'll have 36 seconds. Witchcraft. Has <laughs> <laughs> he gone raving mad? <laughs> yeah. 
I'm superstitious. <laughs> I don't want to go on quoting anymore. 36 seconds, Peter. Witchcraft starting now. I don't believe in that at all, really, witchcraft, because it's just superstitious and it's based on primitive beliefs. And uh, the idea of these crones flying about on broomsticks and... Uh, Paul Merton challenged. Hesitation. Yes, Paul, right. 20 seconds, so you get the subject back, you knew that. Witchcraft, starting now. What a fine play Macbeth is. I love it. <laughs> it's an absolutely wonderful piece of dramatic work. Shakespeare wrote it, I believe, in a great... Uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> Peter Jones challenged. I don't think there's any doubt that Shakespeare <laughs> did write it. <laughs> <laughs> he did. Yes, 10 seconds, Peter. Witchcraft, starting now. And then they descend in on blasted heaths, and they. Uh... Paul Merton challenge. Uh, hesitation. Yes, he's earning all over the place. Four seconds, Paul. Witchcraft starting now. My parents used to dabble in witchcraft when they were younger. They would. <laughs> mm. So Paul again was speaking as the whistle went. And, Jim, it's your turn to begin, and I have to tell you all, we have very little time left, so this will be the last round, alas. Saving is the subject, Jim, and the time starts now. It is difficult for me to think of saving without remembering Gordon Banks and the wonderful save he made against Pele in the World Cup some years ago. I leapt from my seat with joy, believing it impossible for somebody to make such an extraordinary move in mid-air, it appeared to me. I'm surprised he didn't break his back, but he obviously didn't, because he kept playing for a little bit longer. What a treasure he was for the game. Gordon Banks... <laughs> <laughs> I'll get a cab. <laughs> It's a tough game. There's the applause. They're saying they love you, Jim. Right. Um, <laughs> Which is more than the they say for you, isn't it? Really? <laughs> Already he's more popular than you. Are you clapping me or Paul's remark? That's what I know. Right. Paul. 38 seconds to tell us something about saving starting now. Banks, of course, are very keen to get people saving with them as soon as possible. They entice students with all kinds of bribes, a free anorak or a night at the pictures if you deposit your money with this particular financial institution. Um... <laughs> I didn't think I'd get to the end of that, so I stopped to describe, yeah. please. Oh, that's all right, Paul. Um, <clears throat> Peter got in, a correct challenge. 20 seconds, Peter, and you tell us something about saving starting now. Life-saving, I suppose, is very commendable, but I remember Peter Cook once telling me that he saved the life of David <laughs> Frost. A Clement Floyd challenged. Two lives. Yes. Save the life and life-saving. Well, that's not a repetition. It's hyphenated, isn't it, I think? Yeah, mm. it is. Yes, it yes. is, right. Well done, Peter. Um... <laughs> <laughs> Twelve seconds, you continue on the saving starting now. He dragged David Frost out of the sea and gave him artificial um, respiration. Paul Merton Challenge. A uh, repetition of David Frost. No, I didn't. He hadn't David mentioned Frost. David him, before I that. Said him. Peter Cook, he, he'd mentioned. He was, was mentioned Peter I Cook. David Frost before. Nope. No, no, he hadn't. Peter you Cook. just assumed it was David Frost he rescued. Why would I assume it was David Frost? <laughs> but he didn't say it when he was actually speaking. It was a bit after he the didn't, <laughs> He didn't say it. He didn't well, he say did, it did, when did, he was... <laughs> did he say it through a spiritualist or something? <laughs> you see how they all get to me in the end? It's because you're the an end idiot. Of a long series. Where's the man in the white coat? I want to go home now. We could get a glove puppet to do what you do. <laughs> and you'd work him, wouldn't you? Yeah, well, yes. I'm, I'm tempted as it is. <laughs> I was trying to say he was not speaking in just a minute when he said that. The buzzer had gone on the other side of the room. And that's, that was my memory of the situation. Quite. So, Peter, you have nine seconds to tell us something about saving, starting now. He's regretted it all his life. <laughs> <laughs> Poor challenge. Um, hesitation. I know, but <laughs> it was worth waiting for, though, wasn't it? No, I was, I was uh, riding the laugh, laugh, I think. <laughs> yeah. 
And it was a laugh which was worth riding, Peter. Thank you very much. And as we've much. got the last round, there's two seconds left. You can't possibly win starting now. Better use it than let it go rusty. <laughs> So Peter did speak as a whistle went again that extra point, and though I said he couldn't win, he has finished in a very strong second place. Behind him comes Clement Freud and then Jim Sweeney, but out in the lead was Paul Merton, once again our winner. Congratulations. <laughs> I do hope you've enjoyed this edition of Just a Minute. It only remains for me to thank our four talented players of the game. Also, Jane Stevens for keeping the score and blowing her whistle. And also, Ian Messiter for having created the game so that we go on working like this. And Sarah Smith, she is our producer. Thank them and from me, Nicholas Parsons. And we hope that you'll be with us at the same time when we take to the air and play Just a Minute. Until then, bye bye. <laughs> And Nicholas Parsons and the team will be back for the last in the present series of Just a Minute at the same time next week. Welcome to Just a Minute. Hello, my name is Nicholas Parsons, and as the minute waltz fades away, once more it's my pleasure to welcome the four entertaining personalities who this week are going to play Just a Minute. And we welcome back three of our regular players of the game, Peter Jones, Derek Nimmo, and Paul Merton, and we welcome someone who's never played the game before, and that is Craig Ferguson. Would you please welcome all four of them? Beside me sits Jane Stevens, who will keep the score and also blow her whistle when 60 seconds are up. And as always, I will ask our panellists to speak on the subject that I give them. And they will try and do that, as always, without hesitation, repetition or deviating from the subject. Uh, Paul Merton, would you begin the show this week? The subject, reports. Will you tell us something about that in this game, starting now? He spends far too much time trying to be funny. I remember there was a comment in one of my school reports when I was about eight years old. I thought this was a very harsh judgment at the time. My history reports, I suppose, were probably my best. I did love that particular subject, and I had a very good teacher. We specialised in the English Civil War, I remember, and it was a fascinating period to actually be looking at in close detail. This, of course, is a wonderfully turning... <laughs> I suddenly thought nobody's challenged and it put me off. Right. <laughs> Craig Ferguson, first time on the show and first challenge. Uh, what is it? Hesitation. Bit you of a bumbly a... moment. Oh, really, yes. wasn't it? Very bumbly, you get a yeah. point for a correct challenge. You take over the subject. There are 28 seconds left, starting now. There is a famous naval uh, memo that, uh, starting... <laughs> <laughs> I haven't done it before. <laughs> I know you haven't done it before, and I will be generous to you. You did... Uh, well, there's no point me saying anything, then, is there? <laughs> <laughs> I have no clue what's going on. Craig has never been on the show before. Take a nice deep breath, Craig. You've got another point. 24 seconds, reports, starting now. Reports uh, can be broken down into two words, re and ports. Although the word re isn't really a word, unless you come from a different country where the word re means reports. Uh, uh, Derek Nimmo chucked. Repetition of re. Three yes, re. re is not the word on the card. So can I have Derek... another go, then? Yes. <laughs> can name another go. He's a newcomer. 16 seconds for you, Derek on reports starting now. I am going to report Nicholas Parsons as the Director General of the British Broadcasting Corporation for not only being a liar, but a puffed-up buffoon as well. <laughs> and why we shall have to have him on this... Peter Jones's challenge. That has never been a disadvantage at the BBC. <laughs> Peter, I not only agree with the challenge, <laughs> but uh, the thing is that it actually endorses what Derek just said. <laughs> and the fact that this audience should clap 
Why didn't you put Every it to a vote? Every time they say anything anti-Parsons, this mob that we've got in off the streets. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, you've got in with three seconds to go on report starting now. Who is not... Oh. <laughs> no. Correct challenge. What, the Europe of fool? <laughs> <laughs> no, you were deviating. That's what Peter's challenge was. Wasn't it, Peter? Yes, deviating, that's yes. right. <laughs> Three seconds for you, <laughs> Peter, starting now. My masters wrote so badly that I couldn't actually read the comments. <laughs> that whistle tells us that 60 seconds are up, and whoever is speaking at that moment gets an extra point. And it was Peter Jones on this occasion, so he has a lead at the end of the round. Peter, your turn to begin. Losing at just a minute. I don't know whether they've given you that subject to start No, with. I can't imagine. No. <laughs> Peter, 60 seconds on that subject, starting now. Losing at just a minute is something I never really mind doing. It's playing the game mm. that counts. Now, it's not like losing the battle of the back and Bannock Burn, for instance. <laughs> Craig uh, Ferguson, John. A hesitation? Yes, he looked at you, a good Scot, and said Bannock Burn, and he... Yes, that's right. Bit of fear creeping in there that's as well. Right. Yes, <laughs> definitely. 52 seconds for you, Craig, to tell us something about losing at just a minute starting now. Losing at just a minute is something I'm looking forward to immensely as this is my first appearance on the programme. Although I have to say that losing at just a minute is not something that's ever happened to me before. Sometimes I've thought about losing at just a minute and thought... I, I, well, ah, ah. <laughs> Peter Jones, a chance. Well, he just went to pieces. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's very sec- difficult, actually. You don't it's think really it's, it's the fact you've got three other fellas mm. breathing down your neck ready to jump that's on never been a problem for me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's your... <laughs> don't listen to him, it's just jealousy. <laughs> <laughs> 38 seconds for you, Peter. Losing it just a minute, starting now. Sometimes I have aroused sympathy. And on one memorable occasion, I had a bouquet of flowers from Emma Freud, Clement's daughter. Admittedly, she was only ten at the time. It was fairly early on in our long run in this show. And I haven't had anything from her since, unfortunately, <laughs> since she's grown into that lovely woman that appears on television. Um, Craig uh, Ferguson. Definitely deviation of a, different, think... of a different type of a uh, thing. Well, than he's gone right off really... about Emma Yeah, Freud exactly. Yes, right away, so... losing it just a minute. Yeah. Right. But she sent me the flowers, you mm. see. I know, but you went on about wanting more from her and, and everything. <laughs> <laughs> Outrageous. I went on. Of course I went on. That's the purpose of this bloody game. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, but you didn't go on in the right vein. So, deviation with you, Craig. 17 (laughs) seconds, starting now. Losing it just a minute is something that is hurtling towards me ever... Uh, Uh, Derek, no more challenge. Is it yes, Derek, and you've got him with 12 seconds on this subject, starting now. The way to lose at just a minute is to say something nasty about Nicholas Parsons, uh, and then he can... Peter Jones a chance. I know the way to lose. <laughs> <laughs> Give Peter an extra point. Derek gets a point for being interrupted. He keeps the subject. Nine seconds left, Derek, starting now. If you hesitate deviate or repeat a subject, then you will lose at just a minute. I have to go as slowly as possible so the poor Merton can't... Inter- well, Derek Nimmo was speaking then with the whistle went, gained the extra point, and he's equal with Peter Jones in the lead. Then comes Craig Ferguson and then Paul Merton. And, Craig, your turn to begin the subject. What fascinates me? Will you tell us something about that in this game starting now? What fascinates me are insects. I love insects, especially with a bit of cheese. Paul, Merton, you challenge. Repetition of insects, I'm yes. afraid. Your insects oh, really? came in very rapidly after you'd said it. There's a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> There's over six million species of insects. <laughs> Paul, you've got in with 56 seconds on what fascinates me starting now. What fascinates me is insects. I love them. I love the ones with the great big, big... <laughs> Hoisted on your own petard, right. Uh, Craig, you got back in. 50 seconds, what fascinates me starting now? The spider is not uh, one of the things I call... Uh, Derek Nimmo challenge. Uh, there was an uh, yes. And I think the spider's not technically speaking an insect. I was going it? to say yeah. that. I was going to say an arachnopod. Mm. Oh, you were. <laughs> That's why you were, because you couldn't get the word out. That's what it is. 47 seconds, Derek, starting now. What fascinates me is why the British Broadcasting Corporation continues to pay us to talk absolute rubbish about something we know nothing about. The years go by and we sit here getting older and even more infirm and talk this total 
garbage. And actually, uh, are you using up the license fees? What? What's the matter? Deviation, sure. Yes. He might be getting old and infirm, but he shouldn't speak for everybody. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> and this is no place to commit suicide. <laughs> It was deviation because if the show wasn't popular and successful and go round the world, oh, it wouldn't be kept on. So, <laughs> so cholera goes around the world. <laughs> Twenty-nine seconds for you, Craig. On what fascinates me, starting now. What fascinates me is why I the way I buzz. Uh, Derek Nimmo challenge. The way I, the way I. Yeah, yes, another hesitation. Sorry, Craig. It's not seconds. a hesitation. It's a speech impediment. <laughs> <laughs> You get a grant for that, don't you? Yeah, got... 26 seconds, what fascinates me, Derek, starting now. When one goes south of the equator, what fascinates me is the way the water goes down the plug hole the opposite way round. And also that if one sits in a deck chair and you expect the sun to go... Uh, Peter Jones, a challenge. Repetition of one. You had one uh, at the equator and one in the deck chair. So... <laughs> <laughs> I certainly didn't have one in the deck, Jack. I can tell you. <laughs> Peter, I'm sorry, I agree with your challenge. 14 seconds, what fascinates me starting now? People fascinate me more than anything, really. I like watching them, and I divide them into three basic categories. Those who are saying to themselves, I've got it. The others say, I've lost it. And the third category say, what is it? <laughs> Craig, challenge you after the second category. A repetition of say. Well, listen, Craig, you've got in very cleverly. First time on the show, two seconds to go. What fascinates me starting now? What fascinates me is the way that what... <laughs> so, Craig Ferguson is learning very fast, not only speaking with the whistle when getting an extra point. He's actually, at quite an early stage in the show, taken the lead alongside Derek Nimmo. That's one point ahead of Peter Jones. Derek, your turn to begin. The subject, a bank loan. Will you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? The first time I required a bank loan, I went to see some whores that I knew, Sea Hall and Company, bankers uh, who were on Fleet Street at the sign of the leather bottle and have been there since 1672. Henry, who was the head of the firm, gave me a very generous bank loan of some £5,000, which may not seem a lot, but at the time it purchased me a flat in which I still live. I'm very happy with bank loans and always have with these particular bankers who are so generous and so amiable and so well-mannered, charming, and the family... Craig Ferguson, challenge. Repetition of so. There were three so's. Two we might let go, but three we can't. Sorry, Derek. Craig's got in on 28 seconds, a bank loan starting now. If you want to have a bank loan, the best idea is to go to your bank manager and suck up to him. Um, maybe prostrate yourself on the way into the office and... Say what... Uh, Paul Merton Jones. Well, this is deviation, isn't it? There was a phrase there that I wasn't sure about at all. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard of the listening bank, and the bank that likes to say yes, but I've... No, I won't say that. No. <laughs> but, I mean, a lot of people do have to suck up their bank manager they want to learn. Used right? to be just filling a form in my day. <laughs> <laughs> well, some... People have to suck up to them. Great. I disagree with the challenge. You have 17 seconds to continue on a bank loan starting now. Of course, you don't want to overdo it in front of your bank manager. And uh, Peter, Peter Jones, a chance. Repetition of bank manager. You said bank manager the previous <coughs> time. 14 seconds for you, Peter, to tell us something about a bank loan starting now. They're very dangerous things to have because the banks often change their mind, just as you're having a difficult period, if you're in a small business, of course, and they ask for the money back. Well, this is outrageous, and it's ruined thousands of businesses all over the country. Well, Peter Jones got a round of applause for speaking as the whistle went, and Paul, it's your turn to begin the subject. My mistake. Will you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? My mistake was to enter show business. I was so much happier down at the farm with the pigs, geese, ducks, cattle, and all kinds of different animals. Craig Ferguson challenge. Deviation. Why? With the animals, and I'd rather not go into it after that. <laughs> <laughs> but he wasn't deviating from my mistake. No, I disagree, Craig. I'm sorry. Frig? Uh, well, I, I, <laughs> I think I deserve a point for being called Frig. About men. He calls everybody Frig. Oh, does he? Okay. <laughs> You thought I said Frey Kurgerson, did you? Instead of Craig Ferguson. This is a bit of a blind alley, this, really. I know. <laughs> <laughs> or an eyed blally. <laughs> I, 
I disagree with the, the challenge, so you now continue, uh, Paul, with 50 seconds to go on my mistake starting now. My mistake was to sell all those antiques that were lying around the house. My father was a cat burglar and he would come back from such places as Croydon with a sack full of objet d'art. And it was worth a fortune. I took it along... Uh, Craig Ferguson challenge. There are no objet d'art in Croydon. <laughs> Well, 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 no, my dad's got them all. <laughs> he was a very successful burglar. What I like to do on these occasions, Craig, is we give you a bonus point because we enjoyed the challenge. Paul gets a point for being interrupted and he continues with 36 seconds on my mistake starting now. My mistake was I didn't enlist in time for the Second World War. I rushed down to the recruitment office. I put my name down. I... Derek Nimmo challenge. Oh, dear, yeah, he's obviously was an old now. Well, I thought that's what he was coming to. He said he rushed down to the recruiting office. I was in a push chair. It was downhill. Yeah. Just straight <laughs> He could still have rushed down to the recruiting office. It's been two years old. I mean... Couldn't yes. have happened. He's not 45 or whatever. I was too young by minus 12 years. Oh. <laughs> so, um, Derek, it's probably your challenge. And... <laughs> <laughs> it was certainly my challenge. There's no probability about it. I challenge. It's very difficult on just a minute to admit that you've made a mistake. I've made very few in the 26 years, but I think that was one of them. But they have been the same ones over and over again. <laughs> <laughs> you were about to gain something there, Paul. I've watched it. Right, 28 seconds for you, Derek, on my mistake, starting now. My mistake was once when I was appearing in a show in the West End of London and had to catch a railway train to Manchester overnight because I was doing a television the next day, I took a sleeping pill during the second act, got into my pyjamas and dressing gown and into a taxi and went to Euston Station. Unfortunately, after arriving at the destination, they told me that the railway carriage had been delayed for some hour and a half, and there I was, going fast asleep on the platform. <laughs> So they let Derek continue with his story because they wanted to know the payoff until the whistle went and he got an extra point for that. Peter, it's your turn to begin. The subject, behaving badly. Something that never happens in just a minute, I'm sure. You have 60 seconds to tell us something about that subject starting now. Well, it does happen quite often, but uh, I think it's inexcusable. Everybody should behave very nicely and I think if the other panellists watched me and observed the way I conduct myself, then it would be a much better show altogether, more refined and we might enlarge our audience all over the world, you know, particularly people in South America where we are rather thin on the ground, <laughs> as far as... Uh, um... <laughs> Paul Merton hesitation. Yes, he got to South America and couldn't continue. Right, Paul. 36 seconds are left. The subject behaving badly is starting now. I like to think that Adolf Hitler behaved very badly in causing the Second World War. He was told, don't go to Poland, and where did he go? That's exactly the place he went. <laughs> he'd, been, he'd been warned over Czechoslovakia, and before that, over the Ruhr land in around 1935, or Derek might say 1937, but I think it was 19, what I said earlier. Uh, and <laughs> Derek Nemo challenged... Repetition of 19. There was 19, you repeated <laughs> Derek, 14 seconds, behaving badly, starting now. Nicholas Parsons' mother used to behave very badly. <laughs> she used to write letters to me complaining about my appearance on just a minute and also threatened me with the most terrible things if I mentioned her name again. Unfortunately, sadly, she was gathered. Um... Well, Derek Nibbler not only did behave badly, but he gave another example of it then. But he did keep going till the whistle went and gained an extra point for doing so. Craig, your turn to begin. The subject, balloons. Will you tell us something about those in this game starting now? If a Glaswegian calls you a balloon, it's a derogatory term. Phrases like, that balloon on the karaoke machine thinks he's Julio Iglesias are heard often in pubs and clubs around the city. Other balloons that are known in Glasgow are Partick Thistle football team, <laughs> who are known as the famous balloons of the north side of Glasgow by the way they hang about the... Paul Merton Challenge. The repetition of Glasgow. Oh yes, there's too much of Glasgow. It's a pity because I love Glasgow. It's my adopted home. I did five years in Clay, but I was down there. I was going to ask you for a minute. You don't know that, Craig. I'll come from there. I'll tell you. It's your age, Jimmy. Oh, I'll give you one of the money.
could I, could I possibly have a point for being patronised? Yeah. <laughs> if, if you, if you oh, close your eyes, you'd swear you're in Surbiton. <laughs> Balloons is with you, uh, Paul. 40 seconds are left starting now. A balloon could be described as a rubber sphere full of helium. One of my favourite moments in a moment. <laughs> Peter Jones, a challenge. It would be an incorrect description because it can be full of anything. It doesn't have to be full of helium to be a balloon. He said it could be full of helium. That's one example of a balloon. Peter, well. you look very... <laughs> Well, naturally, I'm trying to find objections. Uh, I know. Uh, I'm trying to... This is what they do. They look at me with such disbelief as if to bluff me out of my decision. No, I'm not and... trying to bluff you at all. No, no. it seemed quite genuine to me. No, and if I'm I sorry. were chairman, I certainly award the point to me. <laughs> <laughs> I try to be fair, Peter, and I think, to be fair, he wasn't uh, deviating. So, 32 seconds with you, Paul. Balloons starting now. The Montgolfier brothers are generally credited with the invention of the first balloon which could carry a man up into the air. Of, uh, Craig Ferguson challenge. The balloon didn't carry the man, the basket carried the man. The basket underneath the balloon carried the man yeah, up right. into the air. So, Craig, you've got in with 23 seconds on balloons starting now. The balloon I like best of all is the Christmas... Paul Merton challenge. Repetition of Partick Thistle. <laughs> <laughs> you never know with Nicholas, you never know, you might get it. <laughs> now, he only said party thistle once, so uh, Craig, a, a wrong challenge, it was a try on. 20 seconds left on balloons starting now. The greatest balloon of all time must be Harry Seacombe. No one throughout the world as a great singer and balloon impersonator. And it's very difficult to impersonate balloons. Paul, you challenge. Repetition of impersonator? Yes. No, impersonator and impersonator. Oh, repetition of great then. <laughs> all right, Paul. Oh, I'm really saying all right, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> but just because he's persistent, he's <laughs> still wrong. He, he hasn't means... got a clue whether you said great twice or not. <laughs> you did say the great impersonator and the great Harry Seacom. Nine right. seconds. Balloons with you, Paul, starting now. Partick Thistle are known for the quality of their balloons. Even bigger than Harry Seacombe's, they come to... <laughs> <laughs> Greg, you see, it doesn't matter. You get out, you get back in, you get more points, and you've got him with two seconds to go on balloons starting now. One of the most wonderful balloons I have ever seen. So our first time player of the game is doing extremely well, not only getting a point for the when the whistle went then, but he has gone back into the lead three ahead of Derek Nimmo. And Derek, your turn to begin. The subject, Europe. Will you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? The division between Europe and Asia is generally believed to be where the Ural Mountains commence and then go down and drop into the Caspian Sea. Europe is perhaps, in fact, indeed is, the second largest continent um, <coughs> north... Peter Jones, a chance. A bit of hesitation. Yes, I think so, absolutely right. Yes. Uh, 40, 45 seconds, Peter, for you to tell us something about Europe, starting now. Well, if Africa can be correctly described as the cradle of civilization, then I think Europe is the playpen, because that's where human beings developed some of the finest achievements and inventions, artistic things they did, wrote plays, including Shakespeare, of course, I would uh, put him into that category. Uh, and... Derek Nemo challenge. Well, sort of a hesitation. It was all sort of grinding. Actually, running down. He was sort of <laughs> talking yeah, himself into the ground. I'm yeah. sorry, Peter. I was rather pleased with the first phrase, and yeah, then no. I couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> you were sounding so erudite to begin with, and it suddenly sort of evaporated, didn't it? Yes, quite right. Don't rub it in. <laughs> Twenty-one seconds for you, Derek, on Europe starting now. Your opinions were extremely fortunate because we found here the main domesticated animals goats, sheep, cows, and, of course, horses, beasts of burden. The Americas had no such good fortune, nor did Africa. That is why we, I suppose, became preeminent uh, amongst... Paul Merton challenge. There's a slight sort of hesitation in there. A very slight hesitation, but not enough to penalise him, I don't think. No. So, Derek, I give you the benefit of the doubt. Five seconds to go on Europe starting now. The smallest state within Europe is the Vatican, which only has 1,000 inhabitants. The largest is...
So Derek Nimmo kept going to the whistle went. And with an extra point there, he's now moved forward. He's equal in the lead with Craig Ferguson. And in second place, also equal, are Peter Jones and Paul Merton. And Paul, it's your turn to begin. A good party. That's the subject. Could you tell us something about it in this game starting now? One of the finest parties I ever heard about was Nicholas Parsons' 18th birthday party. Who should be there? Kaiser Wilhelm, Edward II. <laughs> Some marvellous figures from the great historical past. Bodicea popped in with the drinks. And they all cheered him to the rafters. They said, one day you will have a successful career in show business. How wrong could they... No, I think it was a hesitation, a show business. Yes. I couldn't think of the word to describe what you do, Nicholas. <laughs> <laughs> I think show business is quite good, yeah. actually. Yeah. Right, Craig, another point to you and 40 seconds on a good party starting now. One of the finest parties I've ever been to is a party given by Partick Thistle many years ago when they won the Scottish... First Division. <laughs> Derek Nimmo Chunch. Well, it's all Scottish. Mm. That's it, yes. Mm. He was, no, he that's was... how it's pronounced. Mm. <laughs> they do, but they pronounce well, it like... I've yeah. told you, I come from that part of the world. You can't get a kid me on that one. Right. Two, 32 two, two. seconds for you, Derek, on a good party starting now. Oh, my goodness me. I think the best party I ever went to was a transvestite party. And I went as Marlena Dietrich with my beautiful... Uh, Craig Ferguson Chunch. Transvestite party is definitely a deviation of some sort, isn't it? <laughs> Yes, well challenged and well spoken, Craig. We give you a bonus point because we like the challenge. The audience did as well. There he gets a point for being interrupted. Keeps going. 26 seconds left. A good party starting now. My seven-year-old grandson, George Howard, had a particularly good birthday party last year on the 9th of December. We had crackers and an incredible magician who poured out a snake which he put over the top of all these little boys and they remained very still beneath it. Then out came an owl and some bats and it was a very good party indeed. And then we had jelly and cake. <laughs> Right, Derek was speaking again as the whistle went, but other points were scored in the round. He's now one ahead of Craig Ferguson, as he was in the last round. And Peter Jones and Paul Merton are still equal in second place. And Peter, your turn to begin. The subject, models. Can you tell us something about those in just a minute, starting now? When I was a boy, models of farm animals and railway engines and things like that fascinated me, and I used to play with them all day. I had a little table. <laughs> Paul Merton challenge. So a hesitation there. For table, yes. Mm. yes. <laughs> 49 seconds for you on models, Paul, starting now. I once went out with a beautiful model who later turned out to be Derek Nimmo. Imagine my surprise. <laughs> Full length, blonde hair, tight fitting skirt, absolutely wonderful, charming company, and particularly good in bed. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I was amazed when I discovered some five years later, after a passionate affair that I can only. <laughs> <laughs> Craig, what a surely extreme deviation there. <laughs> we must be allowed to lead our own lives. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to hear more, actually, about the affair. Oh, bet you I was did. quite interested myself. <laughs> <laughs> 30 seconds for you on models starting now. Models work almost exclusively on catwalks, although sometimes they get their photographs taken. A catwalk is named a catwalk. Oh, uh, yes, <laughs> Repetition of catwalk. Too many catwalks, yes. Right, 23 seconds on models with you, Paul, starting now. I can still remember those luscious red lips <laughs> mouthing the words, I love you. Take me away from all this. My real name is Belinda. Don't think of me as... <laughs> Only buzz. I couldn't bear any more of this stuff. <laughs> So and I'm sitting next to him. No, you're you're frightened for your future, are you? Yeah, sitting absolutely. Next to him? Yes. Well, You'd be much more frightened for your future if you were sitting next to me, I think. <laughs> Craig, you've got a correct challenge and 15 seconds on models starting now. One of the finest models I ever made was a mod... Uh, uh, Derek Nimmo challenge. Well, he's all stopped, for something. I know he did. I mean, I don't know he's why. actually just died. It, this time. <laughs> in mid-sentence. Derek got in, 12 seconds, models starting now. When Landseer modelled the lions that were now in Trafalgar Square, he made them out of clay. They were very beautiful. They've been preserved, actually, in the Victorian Albert Museum. And if anybody would like to go and see his models, I recommend that they go on a cruise. Mm. 
Well, Derek Nimmo was again speaking as the whistle went and gained a point for doing so. Other points were scored in that round, and I have to tell you, alas, that was the last round in this edition of Just a Minute. So let me give you the final positions. Peter Jones finished in a very good fourth place. <laughs> Great value as always. Paul Merton just behind in third place. Our first-time player of the game did extraordinary work. Tremendous number of points. Didn't quite beat Derek Nimmo. He was one ahead. So we'll say Derek Nimmo is the winner this week. So we do hope you've enjoyed this edition of Just a Minute. It only arranged me to congratulate and thank our four players of the game, Paul Merton, Derek Nimmo, Peter Jones and Craig Ferguson. And also our thanks to uh, Jane Stevens, who's been playing her whistle, keeping the score. And of course our thanks to Ian Mesito, thought of the game, our producer Sarah Smith, who tries to keep us in order. And from them and me, Nicholas Parsons, thank you for tuning in. And I hope you'll be with us again the next time we play Just a Minute. Till then, goodbye. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.